This is Audible. Less Than Three Press presents Melting the Ice Witch by Mel 8. Read for you by Albert Black. Part 1 In the before times, when the cold ice and biting wind were welcoming to our kind, dragons flew. The old storyteller warbled. The man was bent and gray, and his crabbed hands shook on his gnarled staff, but his voice still held the power that had made him the storyteller of the tribe in his youth. The golden dragon rained fire and melted the ice, and the white dragon taught the tribes the spells to survive the difficult yet beautiful climate. Together, the gold and white kept these plains of ice tamed, and the tribes survived in plenty. The old man's voice reached Cam, even from the other side of the fire. Warmth in the ice wastes was hard to come by, especially for one not of the tribe, so Cam appreciated his place near the flickering flames. His brown hair was city short, which meant his ears and neck were exposed to the cold wind. The barbarians all had hair that reached well down their backs, tied in intricate braids with feathers and stones woven throughout. None had hair more elaborate than Lore, the man with the snow-white hair and ice-blue eyes who had the seat of honor next to the storyteller. But, the storyteller's voice darkened, and Cam felt his chest clench at the ominous tone. Such times were not meant to last. The Golden One gathered his followers around and declared that for the happiness of dragonkind, they must separate themselves from the wars of humans. No more deaths of dragons was the Golden One's goal, but the White Dragon disagreed with his methods. They fought with their words, their arguments echoing through the icy canyons, but neither would back down. The White Dragon knew that to abandon the humans was to allow the tribe, his horde, to die in the ice wastes. But the Golden One wished to keep his kin alive, and to do so he needed to rule the humans not to be ruled by human whim. The best of friends and possibly lovers, the golden dragon and the white dragon never spoke again. All but the white dragon flew south, where the plains are formed of grass rather than ice. There they settled in the mountains. They built a city for the humans in the foothills. And the white dragon withdrew to the ice caves, alone. The storyteller bowed his head in sadness, but Lore's piercing eyes scanned the assembled members of the tribe. So we survive. Lore continued the story. His voice was strong, but as the leader of the tribe he had to be. Lore was the tallest and most muscular of all the barbarians, and he was the only witch the clan still had. Bereft of the dragons who allowed us life in the barren waste of ice and snow, the tribe learned new ways to survive. We adapted, so after tens of thousands of years, we still live. Cam looked around at the assembled tribe and frowned. There were barely sixty people of all ages and genders still remaining in the circle around the fire. He had learned that there was another clan to the northwest with equal numbers, but most alarmingly, there were only two witches left, Lore and the man named Bay, who led the other clan. There were no female witches to pass the traits on, nor had any of Lore's children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren shown any aptitude in Lore's hundreds of years of life. The tribe was dying. That was why Cam had been brought north. The only way to invigorate the clans was to breed more witch blood into the lines. The hope was that if Cam were to have a child with one of the descendants of Lore, maybe a child with powers could be born. But Cam wasn't a witch and he hadn't exactly been asked before he was kidnapped and taken to the ice wastes. We live and we are strong, Lore continued. The tribe of the White Dragon does not fade away. The barbarians cheered loudly around Cam, but Cam couldn't join them. As the assemblage broke up, Cam returned to his small tent. Once the barbarians had been sure he wouldn't run away, as if there were some way to survive in the endless ice wastes for a city-bred boy, 
they had given Cam his own space. The tent was small, with just enough room for bedding and a small wooden chest filled with the meager belongings he had accumulated in the last few weeks, but it was heavy with furs and thick woolen blankets that kept the cold and the wind out. Cam curled up in his bed, glad when his blankets began to warm with his body heat, and closed his eyes. The barbarians were nice enough despite the fact that he couldn't give them what they wanted, and it was better than being back in the city. Cam went to sleep with that thought firmly in mind. As much as he had disliked being kidnapped and taken to the barren north, it was still better than what he endured in the city. Cam, Cam, the witchery man! The kids sang as Cam walked past them. He ducked his head but otherwise kept himself from acknowledging their taunts. His mother hadn't exactly been discreet with her passions and lying with the resident witch had supposedly produced Cam. Since the man in question was a charlatan and his mother had never actually said he was Cam's father before they both died, well, all that didn't matter to anyone else. To them, Cam had witch blood, and in his part of the city, it was something to be ridiculed. Cam pushed his way into the small shop where he worked. The bell jingled overhead. Cameron, you're late, the harpy of a woman who was his boss screeched from behind the front counter. As usual, the place was dirty, and the goods covered the shelves with haphazard organization. The sour smell that had appeared early last week had only grown worse overnight. Sorry, ma'am, Cam murmured, ducking his head further as he wended his way through the mishmash stacks of random goods and into the back room. The pawn shop bought and sold everything. Sailors on leave after making the journey down the Great River came to the shop to sell what they could so they would have the funds to drink and carouse in the bars and whorehouses that also populated that part of the docks. It was Cam's job to clean and fix those often grimy and broken items so the owner could in turn sell them for profit to a higher quality pawn shop in the northern part of the city. It paid well for the woman, but Cam only saw a few coins a week for his work. As the witchery man, he was lucky to have a job. So as much as Cam wished, there was no way he could find better prospects. Cam worked hard for his pay, and at the end of the day his hands ached, but his quota was finished. He left the shop at dusk and hurried home. He couldn't tarry because the docks became very dangerous after dark, and since his rent was due, he couldn't afford to stop for dinner anyway. He walked up the three flights of rickety stairs to his tiny apartment. It was one room, barely large enough to hold his threadbare bedding and one change of clothes, but it was a place to sleep. He had left one window cracked while he was away, so the three cats that had crept in during the previous night could leave if they wished. The family of mice that lived under his floorboards was running about, so Cam was careful where he placed his feet as he walked over to collapse on his blanket. One of the mice climbed up onto his pillow and gently nuzzled him on the nose. The mouse was hungry, too, and was probably looking for crumbs, but Cam appreciated the meager comfort his small friend could provide. Cam was smiling despite his rumbling stomach as he slowly fell asleep. Cam knew there was something wrong long before he woke. His dreams had been filled with two cats screeching and his family of mice biting someone's ankles. He had felt movement, but it wasn't normal because he felt a sort of sucking, faded feeling for a while before his body returned to itself in a totally different location. There were two men nearby. Cam could sense that much. Although he was unsure how he knew, his body did not respond to his mind's request to move. The men came to some sort of agreement, and the big, white-haired one walked over to Cam, lifted him into his arms, and carried him over to a waiting wagon. Cam felt his body being tucked under heavy blankets before the wagon began to bump along. It grew cold fairly quickly, so Cam was glad for the blankets. The wagon and the old nag pulling it along were stowed in a small barn next to an equally small wooden house discreetly hidden behind a tall hill. Cam was moved from the wagon into a sleigh, and the strange man attached six dogs to the traces. An old and stooped man came out of the house and waved his walking stick to send the sled off. The dogs whined loudly at the sight of Cam, but obediently began pulling the sled out into the snow-covered plains. The strange barbarian reached forward after the dogs were pointed in the right direction to touch Cam's forehead, and Cam fell back asleep. When Cam woke fully, he was lying on a set of furs in a big fur-lined tent. The large man from the cart was sitting across from where Cam lay, an elaborate tea set at the strange man's feet. The long white hair in thick braids was pushed behind the man's back, 
His ice-cold eyes were focused intently on Cam. My name is Lor, and I lead this clan, the man said formally. He poured two cups of tea and passed one over to Cam as he sat up. The scent of the pale tea was flowery without being cloying, and the hardened clay cup was warm in Cam's hands. He took a careful sip and smiled at the subtle taste of some sort of herb. Why am I here? Cam finally asked when it became apparent that the barbarian was waiting for Cam to say something. Lor bowed his head, as if what he was about to say shamed him. You can help save my clan, Lor said. Your powers as a witch can bring life back into my people. Cam put down the teacup and covered his face with his hands and laughed sadly. Of course, it was about his mysterious witch heritage. Did no one believe him? You're wrong, Cam said with a shake of his head. I'm not a witch, and my parents weren't witches. Lore shook his head, an indulgent smile on his face. We shall see the truth soon enough, he replied. Now, what is your name? Cam woke in his small tent and sighed. Two months had passed since that day, and still Lore watched and waited for Cam to make a mistake and show off his spells. Cam almost wished he could, just to end the farce, but he couldn't do what he didn't have the ability to do. He wasn't a witch. The noise that woke him sounded again. Cam frowned and pulled back his blankets, shivering in the icy night air. He wrapped one of the thicker quilts around his shoulders and left his tent. The sound was coming from the other side of the encampment. Cam followed it and finally saw the curled form of a dog. The poor girl was whining and panting for breath, three newborn puppies tucked under her heaving belly. Cam rushed over and dropped to his knees at her side. There was still one more pup to go, a runt if what Cam could feel was right. The dog barely had any energy left. Come on, Cam cheered, brushing his hand gently across the dog's furry ears. He wondered how she had managed to stray so far from the kennel. Invigorated by Cam's presence, the dog gave a great heave. The runt slowly slid free, and the dog collapsed to pant in the snow. The first three pups eagerly began suckling, but the last just lay shivering helplessly in the snow. The runt was covered in a short layer of gray fur that was totally inadequate for the climate and was clearly too tired to get to the warmth and nutrition it sorely needed. Cam was quick to reach out and gather the tiny thing into his hands. The puppy gave a tiny whimpering moan, but when Cam pushed her in among her siblings, she quickly grabbed a teat and began sucking. The mother dog began licking all four of her pups clean while Cam watched happily for a few moments. So, that's where she got off to. May's voice sounded from behind Cam. Cam jumped in surprise and spun around to face the head woman. May's rules were ironclad, and no one, not even Lore, dared to oppose her on the serious matters of running the camp. She was diminutive in size, although because of her large personality, not many could tell just how short she was at first meeting. May's hair was the color of bleached straw, and her eyes were the same icy blue shared by most members of the clan. She's had four puppies, Cam replied, gently running his hand down the dog's spine. So she has. May agreed. Dug her way out of the kennel and escaped this far, but not far enough. It's a miracle she and her pups survived. May looked over at Cam and sighed. I'll get one of the men to carry her back if you'll carry two of the pups. May walked off purposefully towards the nearest man idling by the central fire. There were always three or four people who were awake at night to make sure the fire didn't go out and to keep an eye on the weather. Cam would have scowled at her assumption that he couldn't carry the fully grown dog back to the kennel, except for the fact that the dog was easily a hundred pounds and Cam weighed only a little more. When May returned, Cam gently pulled the runt and one of her siblings free. May took the other two puppies while Hearn gathered the dog in his arms. They returned the new family to the kennel, where Tom was grumpily filling in the rough hole the dog had clawed through in her escape. The kennel was very large and warm and dark inside, filled with at least five dozen dogs. They found the new mother a comfortable spot and situated her puppies contentedly within reach before leaving. The heavy door was kept closed at night to keep the important dogs from running off and freezing. Cam took one last look over the dog that was gently licking all four of her pups before Hearn pushed the door closed with a thump. Go back to bed, Cam, 
May said sternly in a voice that brooked no disagreement. Cam nodded and yawned, suddenly tired, and headed back to his small tent in his warm bed. Cam huddled next to the fire with his breakfast after his chores the next morning. The hot porridge went a long way towards making the morning palatable, but even with his thick fur coat, Cam didn't think he would ever get warm again. May says I am taking you with me today, Lor said as he took a seat next to Cam. One of the women handing out bowls gave one to Lor, who fell on his breakfast with gusto. Okay, Cam replied, glad to have something to do. Where are we going? Hunting, Lor explained succinctly. Oh, Cam answered with a frown. He didn't dislike hunting exactly, but there was something disquieting about the ice wastes. He always felt sad and lonely whenever he went out there. Once breakfast had been cleaned up, Cam returned to his tent. His usual fur coat was thick enough for the trip, but he needed to change his pants into his pair also lined with fur. The winds could be brutal. He also located the fur hat May had given him that covered his ears and exposed neck, something she had made especially for him, as the rest of the clan could safely go without thanks to their thick hair. Cam met up with the hunting party by the kennels. He helped hitch six dogs to each sled, glad for the time he could take to pet their warm ears. He got to look inside the kennel quickly, too, and saw the new mother and her pops looked healthy and warm. She yipped a hello at him, which made him smile. The sleds were huge constructions, made out of different leather and fire-hardened wood. They were large enough to sit three people across and three deep, plus one or two more people on a steering platform on the back of the sled. Despite their size, they were light enough that Cam could pull an empty sled into place on his own, which was good because it was easier to get all the dogs hooked up that way. Lore walked past as Cam was working with the last of the dogs and ran his hand down the sleds, murmuring something, no doubt some sort of strengthening spell under his breath. Six adult dogs could easily pull a full sled, but they would have a much harder time of it without Lore giving a hand. Cam found a spot on one of the sleds and took a firm handhold. Lore climbed into the steering platform moments later and took up the reins and whip. With a howl, the sleds moved out followed by three hunting dogs. Two of the men were supporting falcons on one arm. The ice wastes were cold and windy, but still beautiful. A mixture of snow, ice, and frozen earth covered the ground as far as the eye could see in every direction. To the northeast lay a mountain range, and there were gentle slopes and hills the further they moved into the foothills of the mountains where fresh game was most likely to be found. Cam actually enjoyed hunting, even though he wasn't really allowed to participate in the gory parts. The twang of bowstrings, the bang of the hunting dogs, and the cry of the hawks as they pounced made his blood sing. The only true drawback was the wind, which blew hard, cold, and lonely across his face, leaving his skin burned, lips chapped, and his soul aching for company. Lore stayed by the sleds, letting the more experienced hunters do their work. Every once in a while, Cam would see Lore gesture, and the ice packing onto the sides of their sleds would suddenly melt, or a man who had fallen into a snowbank would suddenly be dry. It was amazing seeing real magic put to real purpose. Cam had been in awe of it from the very first day he had been living with the clan, and that hadn't changed. There was no fanfare, no sparkles or chanting, but hunting trips were inherently deadly and Lore used magic every trip to keep the hunters safe. Cam did understand the dilemma facing the clans after seeing just how much Lore's powers were needed. If the clan had two or three witches, they could send out two or three hunting parties. With that much more meat available, it would be safer to have more children. But Lore also did much around their simple camp. He kept the winds from blowing over the tents during a storm, kept the vital central fire burning even when sleet soaked the wood, and thawed food when it was too frozen to cook. With just the one witch, the clan was barely holding on. With more, they could hunt more often, have less to fear from the elements, and survival would not be a question any longer. Cam wasn't a witch, however, no matter how often Lore pulled him aside to test him, and there wasn't anything he could do to benefit the clan aside from lending his physical abilities whenever they were needed. So on hunting trips when the men were occupied with catching game and Lore was busy keeping the men alive, Cam watched after the sled dogs and the bags. He was the one to wrap the freshly caught game in heavy tarps to keep predators from smelling the kill on the wind. 
His work was just as vital as Lore's, but he accomplished it without magic. The sun was just heading into descent when the hunters began to trickle back to the sleds for the last time. Cam helped lift their kills onto the sleds and secure them for the ride home. The last hunter, a man named Lenny, returned swearing unhappily. Lost him, Lenny grumbled with a sad sigh. Hit a wind gust and dropped. Couldn't find him. The hunting dog with Lenny sighed as well, looking sad. It took Cam a moment before he remembered that Lenny was one of the men who had trained a falcon to hunt. He didn't have the beautiful bird with him. Cam bit his lip as he passed out carefully packaged lunch portions to all the hunters and the animals. They would eat before heading back to camp. They needed to be home before dark or no one would survive the trip. When Cam set out the packet for the dog that had lost his hunting partner, the animal whined and barely nibbled on his portion. Cam agreed with him. The bird was probably still alive, just hidden behind one of the many hills. Lenny had stayed fairly close to the sleds. It wouldn't be difficult for Cam to go have a look while everyone else was occupied. The dog stood and trotted over to Cam's side when Cam began walking. Lenny had come from the area to the left of the sleds, and Cam felt the bird would be just around one of those hills. You can't smell him, can you? Cam asked the dog at his side once they were far enough away that the noise wouldn't be noticed. The dog panted, which Cam took as a no. The wind is against it, Cam mused. The wind was pushing against his back, which meant the dog wouldn't be able to clearly smell anything ahead. They walked across the slope of the hill. Too low on the hill and they would get lost in a snowdrift, and too high would tax their endurance. Still, Cam was panting by the time they had rounded the second foothill. To the right? Cam asked. The dog obediently headed in that direction. They trudged on around the hill, Cam's boots doing their best to keep his feet above the line of snow. There was a soft creel in the air that Cam could just barely hear. The bird? He asked the dog, who had also frozen at the soft sound. In answer, the animal bounded ahead and vanished into a short rise of snow. Cam hurried to follow, slipping on the ice and accidentally dumping some snow into one boot as he tried to catch up. There were two dark spots on the ground ten feet ahead. One was the dog, and it was gently nosing a much smaller creature that was struggling weakly to get away. Cam hurried over and dropped to his knees at the bird's side. You broke your wing when you fell? Cam asked sadly as he gently reached out and helped the flailing falcon find his feet. If we get you back to your owner, I bet he can fix that. The bird creeled again and hopped forward, his broken wing trailing behind piteously. Cam was very careful as he drew the bird into his arms. The talons and beak were still sharp, even with the bird injured, and he didn't want to jostle the wing unnecessarily. You can get it fixed, Lor said harshly behind Cam. Cam jumped up in surprise, and then stilled quickly when the falcon thrashed from the sudden movement. But only if you can find your way back to the sleds, he added in a voice that was quite angry. That's what he's for, Cam said, pointing his chin at the patiently waiting dog. Lor just shook his head and grabbed Cam's elbow to help him to his feet. You never go out without telling anyone. No one wants your death, child, he added. Cam looked up at Lor's frown and nodded, feeling chastised but still vindicated. If he had told someone he could find the falcon, they would have laughed and refused to let him go. Yes, it had been dangerous, but it had also been successful. Still, the dark look in Lor's eyes made Cam feel bad. Lor was old. Sometimes Cam forgot just how old. He had seen terrible things happen to children he had seen born, whose parents and grandparents he had seen born. Cam knew that one of the reasons Lore worked so tirelessly for the clan was to stop those things from ever happening again. The look in Lore's eyes as he helped Cam navigate through the drifts told Cam that Lore had seen someone vanish into the snowdrifts. Maybe the person had never been found, or maybe the dead, frozen body had been recovered. The images were clearly haunting Lore, and Cam felt guilty for bringing it up. I've got him! Lore called as the sled slowly came into view. The men rushed over. That was really dumb, Carl said as he reached Cam. He cuffed Cam on the back of the head. I'm sorry, Cam said contritely. 
In hindsight, and with Lore scowling behind him, Cam knew it hadn't been the smartest move. But I found him, he added, gently holding up the falcon. Lenny gave a cry of delight and carefully reached forward to take the falcon from Cam. A hood was quickly put on the bird and leather caps were hooked to his talons. Only then did Lenny and Carl take a look at the broken wing. Don't know if he'll ever fly again, Lenny said with a frown as he studied the break. The wing was seriously bent. Lore gripped Cam by the shoulder and pulled him back to his sled. Sit, Lore snapped. He thrust Cam's abandoned packet of food into his hands before bending down and removing Cam's boots. Cam's left woolen sock was soaked and Lore glared up at him at the sight. You'll lose your toes, Lore snarled, drawing the sock down and showing toes that were pale, frosty white. Cam gulped at the sight. Those were not healthy toes. Lore reached out and cupped Cam's toes in his hand. Cam hissed at the sudden extreme warmth that enveloped the numb digits. The fierce look of concentration on Lore's face made Cam bite his lip. Lore was very handsome normally, but when he was so focused, his distinct cheekbones and brilliant hard blue eyes almost had a radiant glow. Lore's beauty, coupled with just how kind he was while taking care of so many difficult responsibilities, made Cam's eyes follow him around the camp and his belly quiver with want. Lore was touching him, even if it was only to work a spell, and that made Cam inordinately pleased. He had rescued the falcon and had Lore by his side for the moment. Lore slowly drew his hand away, leaving behind five healthy pink toes. If your feet get wet, change your socks immediately, Lore cautioned. If your socks freeze, you could lose your entire foot. Thanks, Lore, Cam said softly, smiling up at the large man as Lore stood. Eat, Lore replied gruffly as he turned away. He walked over to where Lenny was shaking his head over the injured falcon and gently placed his hand over the broken wing. The bird screeched and tried to wiggle free before subsiding back into calm sleep underneath its hood. The feeling of pain emanating from the falcon faded away as if it had never been. They all climbed back into the sleds for the journey back to the camp. Cam could tell Lore was tired, but he still worked hard to keep the sleds moving safely. They reached the outer tents just as the bottom edge of the sun began to dip behind the mountains. Cam was grateful when May sent other men to help unload the sleds and to bring the meat where it could be properly cleaned and preserved. Cam focused on unhitching the dogs while the bustle continued around him. He was ducked down behind a sled, trying to untangle a set of traces so he could find the clip to free the dogs still attached when May pulled Laura aside. We got another note, she said quietly. He says he's got a woman this time, and swears that even though she isn't a witch, both her parents are. A woman with witch blood? Lore asked, sounding excited. That's excellent. She could really give the clan the help we need. When does he want to meet? In two days, May replied. She sounded a bit disappointed in Lore's reaction, but there was also a lot of understanding in her tone. Cam could understand the dilemma from personal experience. He had been through the same thing that woman was about to experience. Kidnapped from whatever life she had been leading in the human city, the woman would be brought north and would be enticed to have children with one or more of the men from Lore's bloodline. Witch blood from both sides of the parentage would help ensure that a new witch would be born to the clan, something they desperately needed for their very survival. While May had been disapproving of the overall plan, Cam knew she was aware of the consequences of failure as well. Lore, well, Lore had been watching as the subsequent generations of his people slowly grew smaller and smaller. His desperation to save the tribe would force him into agreeing to any plan, even the most remote and morally repugnant idea. Lore and May moved off and Cam finally untangled the leather straps and found the tie to free the dog. He got a lick of thanks from the sled dog, which made him smile, but Cam still felt unsettled for the remainder of the evening. He didn't want to go back to the human city. He liked living with the clan in the ice much more than living in the docks with humans that hated him. He wanted the tribe to survive, but he didn't know if he could agree with the current method. Cam went to bed that night still feeling flustered which is probably why he had such a vivid dream of his own first few days in the ice wastes.
Part 2 After their meeting that first morning, Cam didn't see Lore for at least a week. Instead, three women, all with light blonde hair and blue eyes, came by a couple times a day. He had been given a small pallet in the large communal tent the clan seemed to use for anything that couldn't be accomplished outside where a sudden snow squall could wet drying furs or a blast of icy wind could knock over an important project. A young woman named Ness brought breakfast every morning. She would enter the tent, bring the tray of food she was carrying over to the side of his bed, take off her heavy fur coat, and then they would share a pleasant meal together. Only... Cam couldn't help noticing that underneath her fur coat, Ness wasn't wearing all that much. She was fully covered, because going without would cause frostbite even inside the tent, but she would shift and suddenly a flash of leg or a curve of her breast would appear. Cam always politely averted his eyes and couldn't help wondering if the people of the North had different expectations of propriety than he was used to. A polite girl didn't do such things in the human city. Cam would have thought that maybe only Ness behaved in such a way if it weren't for Kara. She was the woman who invited Cam out for a walk every afternoon and brought him to the central fire to get lunch. She introduced Cam to the difficult life the tribe was forced to live out in the ice wastes. He enjoyed spending time with Kara, and learning about the place he had been taken was important to Cam, but she kept grabbing his arm and pushing her ample chest against him or bending down in front of him to show off her rounded behind. Cam wasn't sure how to tell either of the girls to stop. He wasn't interested in what they were offering. Their leader, Lore, had been much more interesting to Cam, but he didn't want to embarrass anyone by speaking up. May, the third woman who brought him back to his tent at night after dinner, was the only one who kept herself properly clothed and distanced from Cam. She was older and good at scowling, but Cam liked her best out of all three of the women he had been introduced to, probably because it was clear from her actions that she wasn't interested in seducing him. She was just there to keep an eye on Cam. The really strange part about living in the cold and ice was that strange things kept happening to Cam. May once asked him to hold a satchel of herbs and he fell asleep. Another time, he tripped walking out of the tent and almost took Kara down with his flailing to keep his feet. He burnt himself by the fire one day during lunch because somehow the flames had risen up to snap at his hand. At the end of the first week, Laura came into the tent carrying the breakfast tray instead of Ness. He set out tea along with the food and joined Cam in eating. After his third sip of tea, Cam started to feel a bit funny. By his fifth sip, he figured he had been drugged. He glared accusingly up at Lore, but was surprised by the glare he got in return. You are a good actor, I admit, Lore said in a voice that was somehow calm and genial despite his closed features. You've managed to expertly not evade every magical trap I've set, but I will have the answers I'm seeking. Are you a witch? Lore asked, his voice suddenly going sharp. His eyes, which had been focused on Cam's face, appeared somewhat glassy, as if they were looking at something Cam couldn't see. I'm not, Cam answered, his voice slurred from whatever drug Lore had put in his drink. My mother was a whore and she never told me who my father was before she died. Everyone always assumed the local potions man was my father because she used to pay him with services rather than money, but he was a fake anyway. Why do you ignore the women I've sent to you? Lore asked once Cam's running mouth finally closed. Cam couldn't help laughing. I, I don't like girls like that, so having them throw themselves at me won't have any effect. I would prefer you without any clothing than Ness. Cam said, feeling his face heat up as his mouth spoke without any input from his brain. He had never told anyone he preferred men before. In the docks, that was either a death sentence from close-minded folk or a whore's sentence from desperate sailors on ship leave. He might as well have sold himself to one of the houses in the red light district if he weren't going to tell anyone about his sexual preferences. It didn't matter that Prince Leon was paired with another man because the people living along the docks preferred to be cold and hard in every situation. It was the way life worked there. I see, Lore said, his eyes returning to focus on Cam's face. That is... unfortunate, he finished. Lore got to his feet with a sigh. Eat your breakfast. The potion will wear off by the time you're finished. 
Go find May when you're done. Cam finished his breakfast quietly, wondering what had just happened. Had Lore tricked him into taking a truth potion? Was Cam going to be thrown out now that Lore knew the truth? When the fuzziness finally receded and he had finished with breakfast, Cam stood and left the tent. He found May by the central fire. She looked at him with a grunt and a nod. You're not big enough to do any real chores, she grumbled. You like the dogs though, right? She asked without expecting an answer. No doubt she had seen Cam petting the various dogs that roamed freely around the camp. Every morning you'll get up and feed the dogs before you get your breakfast. Then I'll find some other chores for you for the rest of the day. I'm moving you to a single man's tent, she added. Now go help Hearn with the dogs. May turned back to the cook pot over the fire in clear dismissal. Cam walked towards the kennels and couldn't keep a small smile off his face. He wasn't being sent away. They were keeping him, and they were integrating him into their society. Doing chores meant he was earning his keep, and having his own tent, instead of sleeping in the communal one, gave him the privacy that every other member of the clan enjoyed. Cam didn't have to go back to his lonely apartment by the docks or his hated job. He didn't care that it was cold and icy or that Lore probably would never speak with him again. The camp was going to be his home, and Cam was elated. Cam woke up the next morning with mixed feelings from his dream. He was still happy living with the clan, but Lore only spoke with him when Cam did something stupid like run off into the wastes with only a dog and a bird. Cam put the thought out of his mind and firmly pushed his blankets back, wincing as the cold air hit his skin. He scrambled into his fur coat and made sure his hat was pulled down to cover his ears and neck before pushing back the flap to his tent and stepping outside into the morning sunlight. The day was bright, clear, and cold. Cam took a bracing second to ready himself for the chill before he began hurrying off to do his morning chores. He had to set out the food for all the dogs. Their hunger was beginning to press on his awareness. He managed three steps forward before his foot slid on something, possibly ice that Lore had missed when he checked the safety of the camp every morning, and went flying. Cam landed face first in a snowdrift and his hat popped off. He pushed himself to his knees, spluttering and embarrassed as he tried to brush snow off his face. One of the younger dogs came gambling up to Cam. He was only a few months old and liked to play, but instead of lurching into Cam's lap, the puppy growled and grabbed Cam's hat before taking off at a run. Cam could already feel the icy wind chilling his ears and neck. Besides, that hat was the first thing someone had ever made for him out of kindness. He didn't want to lose it. Bring that back! Cam yelled after the puppy in as authoritative a voice as he could. The puppy froze in place and turned his head to whine at Cam. The look of fun in the dog's eyes had vanished. That's right, it's bad to take people's things, Cam scolded. Bring it back! The puppy slunk back to Cam and dropped the hat at his feet. Cam bent down to brush off the hat and firmly pull it back down over his ears. Then he gave the puppy a good belly rub for listening to Cam's orders. Let's go get you some breakfast, Cam said to the puppy that was wagging his tail happily. Cam picked the dog up with a grunt, the puppy was almost too big to carry, and hurried over to the kennel where Hearn already had the heavy door open. The dogs began to circle Cam excitedly as he began digging out and apportioning food. Only once every dog was happy did Cam move into the kennel. The new mother winded him from her position on the floor with her four puppies, but otherwise the kennel was empty. You're being awfully lazy today, Cam scolded as he placed the mother's portion in front of her. His eyes were for the puppies, the runt in particular. They all seemed to be happily suckling away for their breakfast, but the smallest one really had to fight to get her nose in there. Cam was quick to step forward and push the other three puppies into a more organized pile so all the puppies had an equal chance at getting breakfast. The runt gave a happy grunt and set to. Cam was impressed with how energetic the puppies were at only a day old. The dogs living on the ice must mature at a faster rate through necessity. A small, helpless puppy couldn't survive for very long in such a harsh climate. The city strays he was used to weren't nearly as large or lively as the clan's dogs. Maybe there was a touch of magic involved in their growth, too. Hearn came into the building with two shovels. Cam took one and they quickly got about their task of cleaning up. Breakfast that morning was subdued. Word had gotten around that Laura was heading south the next day. 
There was worry for Lore's safety, as well as worry for the safety of the clan without their only witch. Lore spent the day casting as many spells as he could for the clan, trying to prevent any catastrophe that could occur during the hours he would be so far away. Cam spent the day doing odd chores for people, trying to keep his own feelings out of the way of patching tents and stitching fur. By the end of the day, Cam had seen Lore in conference with May at least six times, and his poked fingers were regretting him ever getting close to a needle and thread. Lore had already left by the time Cam woke the next morning. The worry hanging over the clan was even heavier than the previous day. No one strayed far from the central fire and voices were hushed. Cam got the happy job of brushing the dozens of dogs with Hearn and May. If their fur got too matted, it could pull, leaving a bald spot that was prone to frostbite and could seriously injure or kill an animal. The dogs came to Cam one by one and flopped down next to him as he pulled the heavy comb through their fur. The dog's fur was mostly gray, but the occasional white or brown was pulled off the comb and tossed into the fire, too. Cam was just happy that he didn't have to poke his fingers with needles a second day in a row, but he felt how pleased each dog was with the attention and petting they were getting, so his mood was fairly good by lunchtime. May started the day frowning, and even though she seemed to enjoy playing with the excited dogs, her frown only grew as the afternoon neared. She kept glancing south, in the direction Lore was supposed to be coming back from. But by the time lunch had been cleaned up and they had returned to the dogs, May started glancing up at the sky just as often. It was getting dark awfully early, and Cam only realized the cause was heavy clouds coming from the west when May started giving those clouds sharp looks while they were washing the lunch bowls. When the clouds started to take on a faint green tinge, May calmly stood up and started barking orders. Blizzard's coming! She yelled, Start packing up! We're settling in the caves tonight! Cam gulped. He had never been in a blizzard before, just the regular snowstorms that fell every few days. His own fear and the scurry of everyone around him galvanized Cam. He quickly gathered up all the brushing paraphernalia and started calling the sled dogs over. Even as the sled started to fill with the clan's belongings, Cam was busy hitching up six dogs to every sled. When all ten sleds were ready and he still had a couple of loose sled dogs, Cam improvised a way to hook one or two more dogs to the traces until every sled dog in the clan was accounted for. I've packed up your tent, Hearn called as he dropped the trunk that usually held Cam's meager belongings onto the sled Cam was working by. Somehow the trunk had been turned into a case for Cam's entire tent. The heavy leather straps that held the top closed also secured the tent poles and Cam was sure his furs and the tent itself were stored safely inside. The clan was clearly prepared for any eventuality. Thanks, Hearn, Cam called after Hearn's back as the man rushed off to complete another task. The hunting dogs were still loose, but Cam already had a solution for them. He had seen hunting parties go out with the dogs on long leashes, attached to the sleds when the hunters didn't want their dogs to stray far during the journey. Cam dug out those leashes and started calling the hunting dogs to the sleds. I've never rounded up all those animals so quickly before, May said as she stopped by the sleds and saw all the dogs sitting calmly in their leashes and traces next to their sleds. Usually excitement from our packing sends them into a frenzy. Maybe there's something to what Lore was saying. She added offhandedly. Is there anything you need help with? She asked finally. Cam nodded. I've gotten all the dogs except the new mother and her four pups. I wasn't sure how you wanted me to secure them. May hummed thoughtfully. Well, the mom's okay to run by now. Hook her up to a leash. Take out one of the old furs from the kennel and find a place on the same sled to stash the pups. I doubt the runt is strong enough to make the journey, so if you can only find space for three... You'll have to leave her behind. Cam frowned at that thought. The runt might be small, but she was going to grow into a great hunting dog. Leaving her behind would be a great disservice to the clan. All right, Cam said as he hurried off to the kennels. The mother dog was waiting by the door with all four of her pups whining awkwardly at her side. The runt took a tumble as she tried to hop forward to say hello to Cam. He quickly bent down to scoop her and her siblings up before turning to the mother. Come on he said gently. Cam led them at a pace slow enough that he didn't accidentally drop one of the squirming pups in his arms. He leashed the mother to the side of one of the sleds and tucked the three pups into a secure space between two trunks where they could still smell their mother. 
Cam could have fit the runt into the space as well, but the poor thing was shivering and unhappy, so he tucked her into his coat where Cam knew she'd be warm and secure. The sound of panting dogs made Cam turn just in time to see Lore's sled rush into what was left of the camp. Lore was at the helm, but he was alone. Move out now, he yelled before anyone could turn and ask questions. The storm's much closer than it looks. Luckily, the tents, people's belongings, and the essentials like food and peat were already loaded. Only the unessential things were left behind, and everything that could be grabbed as people rushed to the sleds was grabbed. Cam ended up in Lore's sled with Ness, Hearn, and Lore, as well as whatever trunks they could stash last minute. Lore waited as the other sleds moved out. He was giving his exhausted sled dogs a rest, and he wanted to be the last to make sure everyone got out safely. Cam couldn't help wondering where they were going. May had mentioned caves and the sleds were heading in the direction of the mountains, but Cam didn't know about any place the clan had prepared for such an event. The wind started to pick up after the first half hour as the ice-covered mountains slowly became larger the closer they got. Cam watched from his place at the back of the sled as the heavy green clouds grew closer as well and what looked like a curtain of white began inching nearer. Lore was sweating after the first hour of travel. His face looked pale and worn. Hearn was guiding the sled, so Lore must be trying some sort of spell. He looked exhausted and frustrated that whatever he was trying to do wasn't having as strong an effect as he had hoped. The first sleds were just vanishing around a curve in the mountain that did not look entirely natural when the curtain of white caught up with them. Cam got a glimpse of a huge opening in the mountain many times the size of their sleds before all he could suddenly see and hear was white and wind. He wouldn't have been able to tell which way the mountain was, but Lore seemed to know. Cam thought he could faintly hear Lore shouting instructions to Hearn over the wind. Their sled was going to move forward until they caught up with the one in front. They had used rope to guide all the sleds into the mountain. Cam thought they started moving forward again, but all he felt was a huge jerk as the sled was suddenly and violently pulled off the right. Cam saw one of the sled dogs come tumbling past out of his peripheral vision and he heard Ness yell as she also disappeared from the limited scope Cam could see in the total whiteout. But Cam had problems of his own. He had lost his grip on the safety straps he'd been holding and couldn't find them again. The sled overcorrected to the left and Cam felt his knees slide along the frozen furs and wood. His hands scrabbled for purchase, but it wasn't long before he too was tumbling off the side of the sled into the drifts of snow. All Cam could see was white. The snow was coming down so heavily that he could barely see his gloved hand in front of his face. The wind whistled in his ears so loudly that Cam couldn't even hear himself breathing. He was probably only a few feet from the sled, but he couldn't tell which direction the sled was. The runt squirmed against Cam's chest, picking up on Cam's anxiety. We'll be all right, Cam murmured to the pup as he ran his hand down the front of his fur coat. The runt couldn't hear him, but she seemed to understand his intent because she calmed. Cam bit his lip as he waited, hoping to see Lore come out of the blizzard to help Cam back into the sled. After an indeterminable amount of time, Cam decided that Lore wasn't coming for him. Cam understood. Lore had the rest of the clan still trapped outside the mountain on their sleds to get to safety. Just saving Cam could lose many lives. There was also a sense of worry just behind him, which reminded Cam that one of the sled dogs as well as Ness had also been thrown off when the traces snapped. He could feel that dog just behind him putting out those strong emotions of anxiety. Cam took an involuntary step in that direction and shrugged. Lore couldn't come save Cam, so it wouldn't matter if Cam moved to comfort the dog. Maybe he could find Ness too. Cam almost stepped on the dog where he was crouched over Ness's huddled form. Both had white snow almost totally obscuring their fur coats. Ness! Cam yelled, but his voice was lost in the wind. He hurried forward against the wind until he could drop to his knees at her side. Are you hurt? He yelled when she looked up in surprise. There were tear tracks freezing on her cheeks and she couldn't seem to answer, but Cam saw the despair on her face. She thought she was going to die. The dog whined above Ness and tried to push her forward with his nose. Ness batted the dog away impatiently, but Cam understood. You can guide us to the cave? Cam asked even though the dog couldn't hear over the wind. 
The dog lumbered to his feet in the snow and wind and pointed his nose to the right. Cam turned his head in that direction, but couldn't see anything except snow. Still, it wouldn't hurt to try. He caught Ness under the arms and yanked her to her feet, pointing in the direction the dog had indicated. She shivered and shook her head, more tears falling, but didn't stop Cam when he began pulling her in that direction. The dog took point, staying so close that his tail brushed against Cam's knees, and Cam followed with Ness clinging desperately to his arm. Cam couldn't tell how long they walked, or if they were walking in circles. His socks were wet and his hat wasn't thick enough to keep his ears from freezing. Ness was having trouble staying on her feet, putting much of her weight on Cam's shoulder. Finally, Cam thought he saw a red-colored light shining through the snow. He couldn't be sure, but the dog was aiming in that direction. Slowly the light came into greater focus and soon after Cam could begin to see two dark forms standing just ahead. Lore was standing in the entrance to the giant cave Cam had seen earlier, one arm outstretched with a pulsing orb of red light shining from his fingers. He was leaning on May, who looked like it was taking much of her strength to hold Lore up, and glaring out at the snow. The sled dog bounded forward happily, pushing his head into May's side. She looked up and saw Cam and Ness, her lips opening in what Cam assumed was a cry of shock since he still couldn't hear anything over the wind. Lore turned his head as well and started yelling. Two men rushed out of the cave towards Cam. One took Ness and the other wrapped Cam's arm over his shoulder and helped Cam take the last few steps into the mountain. The sudden cessation of wind was abrupt and startling to Cam's ears and skin. He stumbled, shivering further into the monstrous opening as Hearn determinedly guided him along wide stone hallways until they entered another huge doorway into an empty cave. Cam didn't have time to marvel at how smooth the walls were because seconds after he stepped into the room, Lore charged forward. You idiot! Lore snapped. What were you thinking? His hands came up to cup Cam's cheek and warmth began to spread through Cam's shivering limbs. I fell off the sled, Cam forced out through chattering teeth. I found the sled dog in Ness and the dog knew the way back here. Don't scare me like that. Lore snapped again. He started yanking at the clasps of Cam's coat, trying to get the soaked material off. Bring him over to the fire, Lore, May called where she was helping Ness get her own soaked and frozen clothes off. And stop using magic, you're too exhausted. Lore guided Cam over to the fire in the center of the cave where the rest of the clan members were also huddled. The sleds were parked around them and all the dogs had found somewhere to lie down. Lore got Cam to sit and resumed pulling off Cam's fur coat. The runt tumbled free with a yip. Lore and May watched incredulous looks on their faces as the puppy clumsily found her feet and began exploring. You had that pup in your coat the whole time? May asked. Cam nodded, feeling sleepy. She wouldn't have made it on the sled, he explained, but his words were slurring so he wasn't sure just how much May understood. Cam felt his boots and socks being pulled off and heard Lore's swearing at the state of his feet, but even the extreme heat of Lore's spells on his toes and May's scolding couldn't keep Cam awake. He slumped to the side, feeling his face hit Lore's shoulder, and drifted off. Part 3 Cam woke when something licked his face. He slowly opened his eyes and was greeted with the sight of two barely opened blue puppy eyes staring him right in the face and a wet black nose nudging his cheek. Runt whined. Go find your mama if you're hungry, Cam grumbled softly. The cavern was dark and quiet. Apparently everyone else was asleep and the fire was slowly dying down. Runt whined again. The part of Cam that wasn't mostly still asleep marveled at how mature she was more like several weeks old than several days. Any worry he still had that she might not survive dissipated. She's over in that direction, Cam told her, pointing over his shoulder in the direction he could feel three slumbering puppies. Runt licked Cam's face again and toddled off, her nose working furiously as she whined piteously for her mother to find her. Cam waited until he felt Runt's satisfaction at finally being found before sighing and pulling the sleeping fur higher over his shoulder. He turned his head to tuck his nose back into the warm chest he was pressed against and felt the arm around his waist tighten in response. 
It took Cam a few seconds to realize he was sharing his sleeping fur with someone else, and a few moments after that before he understood that a man was holding him tightly. Cam slowly looked up to find Lore's bright blue eyes studying him intently. I wasn't sure if you were going back to sleep, Lore said softly with a small smile. Um, Cam forced out, knowing his mouth was hanging open in surprise. Hi, he finally said. Hello, Lore answered. You gave me quite a scare yesterday, you know. Oh, well, thanks for warming me up, Cam stuttered out in reply. Lore's arm left Cam's waist, but before Cam could begin to feel regret that Lore was leaving, Lore's hand tilted Cam's head back. Don't vanish on me again, Lore admonished, his blue eyes still and serious. Cam stared into those intent blue orbs, unable to blink or look away as Lore slowly bent closer. Their lips touched both chapped from the cold wind, but warm and tender. Lore slowly drew away and laughed gently at Cam's shocked face. Cam frowned. What did you do that for? he grumbled. Why did I kiss you or why did I laugh? Lore asked, his voice still quiet but too full of humor to be called a whisper. I kissed you because I thought you were beautiful from the moment I first saw you under that bad witch's spell. But my duty to the clan came first, so I sent those girls and maid to watch over you. I'm laughing because I should have kissed you when you told me you only liked men while you were under the influence of my truth potion. You're an idiot when it comes to the ice, but you somehow always come out ahead in the end, with or without my help. But I realized yesterday that you might not return from your next silly mishap. I didn't want to lose my chance of getting to know you better. Oh, Cam replied once Lore had finished his explanation. I like you too, he added with a shy smile. Good, Lore said, and he gave Cam the first full smile Cam had ever seen grace Lore's lips. It was as beautiful and as blinding as a field of untouched snow and made Cam's heart lurch in his chest. We should get back to sleep, Lore continued as he reached over Cam to pull up the fallen sleeping fur. We both had exhausting days yesterday and need rest in order to recuperate. Lore pulled Cam down onto his chest and wrapped his arm back around Cam's waist. Cam snuggled into the warm embrace and let his exhaustion drag him back down into sleep. When Cam next woke, it was the noise of people speaking and breakfast dishes clanking. He was alone in the sleeping fur, but moments after he opened his eyes, May strode up to press a bowl of hot cereal into his hands. Good to see you up, she said with a nod hello. Lord's just checking on Ness. He'll be back over in a minute. She walked off to help someone else while Cam was glancing around to find Lore. The cavern they were in was not natural, that much Cam could tell as he looked around. The dogs were roaming freely and happily around the sleds, which were mostly unpacked around them. The cave dwarfed the clan horribly, emphasizing just how few members were sitting around the fire pit that looked like it had been carved into the stone floor centuries ago. Lore was kneeling by the fire, one of Ness's hands in his, and Cam could tell by the distant glaze in Lore's eyes that he was casting a spell of some sort on her. Cam picked up his spoon and started eating while he watched Lore work. He had an impersonal touch as he looked over Ness's red and chapped hands, Hands that were probably so frostbitten the night before that she shouldn't have them at all. Lore was clearly quite powerful and very caring, which Cam admired. Lore was called away to look over one of the sleds when he finished with Ness, so Cam finished his breakfast alone. He clambered to his feet, bare toes cringing against the cold stone floor, and brought his bowl over to the woman in charge of washing up. Cam returned to his sleeping pallet, found his socks and boots, and went exploring. Runt toddled over when Cam walked past the mother dog. Cam gave her a good belly rub before guiding Runt back to her mom. The cave was huge, but there was only one entrance. The giant hole along one wall sparkled with a little magic, so Lore must be using a spell to keep the wind and snow out. Cam walked in the other direction, past where the sleds and the dogs had their own circle away from the humans. The wall there wasn't as smooth, which seemed strange to Cam considering there was hardly a blemish along the walls otherwise. The way the stone curved was deceptive. There was a small opening cleverly hidden amid the misshapen rock barely large enough for Cam to slide through. Cam carefully stepped out of the passage into a smaller but still very large side cavern. 
The light was different than the firelight in the main cave, seemingly coming from within the walls rather than from a fire. Cam walked closer to one of the shining walls and gasped at what he saw. Piles upon piles of gems and golden statuary were frozen in a thick layer of ice, forever locked away because not even a chisel and hard work would break through to the treasure hidden inside. Cam walked along the ice wall, mesmerized, until he reached a spot that was darker than the rest. He put his hands up to shade his eyes and pressed his nose into the ice, trying to see why that section was different. He looked down lower and gasped, a gigantic pang of loneliness shooting through his heart. There was a giant, lizard-like, scaled head frozen in the ice. It was neatly hidden thanks to its own colorless hide, and it looked like it was attached to a body that could easily explain why the caves and entrances were so big. Magnificent, isn't he? Lore asked softly from behind Cam. What is it? Cam asked, his own voice soft in an almost reverent tone. That, Lore replied proudly, is the white dragon. Why is he so sad? Cam asked his voice tight with tears as the pulsing loneliness continued to erupt from the sleeping dragon encased in ice. Lore rested a hand on Cam's shoulder, gently pulling him away from the wall of ice. Because he is alone, Lore explained as he drew Cam towards the exit. The other dragons left, leaving White behind as the only steward of these mountains. Not even the golden dragon stayed. That's terrible! Cam gasped as he slid through the opening. Lore forced his larger body through afterwards, still holding onto Cam's shoulder, and they both walked back into the more natural firelight together. Is there anything we can do? Lore shook his head. It's all been tried, thousands of centuries ago. But I did see a dragon when I went south. He was just a baby and in human form. But he was proof the rest of the dragons haven't died off. So maybe we could find the golden dragon and get him to make the white happy again? Cam asked excitedly. Lore shook his head again. There are tales of three golden dragons living in the southern mountain range, but they do not contact us. Why not? Cam asked, tugging Lore down onto their shared sleeping fur as he spoke. Cam could think of at least one golden dragon, Ananile, who was mated to Prince Leon, but he couldn't think of any others aside from the eldest who was rumored to be gold-colored as well. Since the eldest never left the dragon caves, Cam didn't know if that were true or not. Because they abandon us so they feel guilty, and we refuse to heed their orders to move to the human city they created, so they do not listen to our needs. Only the white dragon cared for us, but white cannot help us now. The conversation ended there, but Cam couldn't help thinking about that poor dragon encased in ice for the next two days while they waited out the storm. On the second night, the old storyteller gathered them all close to the fire. There was once a city, a beautiful city, where dragons and humans lived together in harmony. The storyteller began in a creaking, ominous voice. Humans came from as far as the wilds to see the city. It was surrounded by ice, but thanks to the powers of the dragons, remained warm and fertile. But the dragons warred, and the city was lost. Lore sat down next to Cam on the bedroll they were sharing, but stayed silent. Cam was listening intently to the storyteller since he hadn't heard this tale before. The ice began to flow into the city, freezing the underground hot springs and encasing the verdant fields and our homes in unending snow. The wind blew and the blizzards came and the tribe was forced to abandon the city. They traveled far to the dragon mountain we are in right now. Old White slept as he sleeps now unchanged. The tribe pleaded with White, begging for him to return and to save their city from utter destruction. But White, in his pain, could not hear. So the tribe left White, wishing to give him the space and time to recover from his loss, and traveled across the ice to build a new home, or homes, now that there are two clans. In times of great need, we return to White's sanctuary, hoping one day White will return to save the tribe from the endless ice. The storyteller fell silent and the clan echoed him for a long moment before a child squealed. With the reverence broken, 
They all headed towards their bedrolls and another night under White's unknowing care. The next morning, they waited for the sky to finish clearing. It took a while for the winds to stop blowing, and after that they still needed to unblock enough of a pathway through the accumulated snow that they could get their sleds on top of the new snowpack. He didn't visit White again, because the horrible, wrenching feeling of loneliness made Cam want to cry. One visit was enough to understand why that emotion was so prevalent in the winds over the ice wastes. The dragon was projecting so forcefully that Cam could feel him even outside the mountains. Lore seemed to be able to tamp down those emotions while Cam stayed within his magical shield. The second after Cam stepped through the barrier, keeping the snow and wind out of the gigantic entrance to the cave, the emotions returned full force. Cam hated thinking he was getting used to feeling something so awful, but he rarely staggered when he was sent outside anymore. The ride out of the mountain was the opposite of the scramble to the mountains. The sky was cloudless and so blue that the light reflected off the snow and hurt Cam's eyes. Lore gave him some charcoal to rub on his cheeks below his eyes to help with some of the sun glare. Everything Cam could see looked pristine and peaceful. A clean white blanket covered everything. He didn't even realize they were back to the campsite until Hearn finally dropped the traces with a sigh and pulled out a shovel. Cam worked at unhitching the dogs, little Runt following him around playfully to the amusement of the other animals, but he kept an eye on what everyone else was doing as he worked. After an hour, they finally located the top of the only permanent structure in the camp, the kennels, and soon had the snowdrift hauled away. The dogs were happy to be allowed back into their home. They located the fire pit soon after, and it wasn't long before Cam could smell lunch cooking. We've put your things in Lord's tent. Ness said shyly when Cam walked over to the fire to see if there were any other jobs he could help with. Ness couldn't look Cam in the eye. Cam assumed she was embarrassed about her behavior in the blizzard, and he didn't know how to reassure her. Thanks, Ness, Cam replied with his own blush. It had caused some talk in the cave when Lore had climbed into bed with Cam the second night. The first night could be explained as sharing body warmth or as a long-term healing spell, but the second night proved there was a deeper attachment. Overall, the clan seemed to accept it. Lore was known to prefer men. The clan also seemed to like Cam and could see how much Lore liked him too, which went a long way towards their approval. We need to send out a hunting party tomorrow, May said to Lore as Cam said goodbye to Ness and headed in their direction. But otherwise we're in good shape. Now tell me about why you returned from the south alone. Cam didn't mean to eavesdrop, but Kara called him over to stir the stew bubbling over the fire while she took her turn getting her tent set up, and he was too close not to hear the conversation. Which Harold was as bad as we thought he was, Laura sighed. Kidnapped the girl from her family for some sort of revenge plot. The girl's brother came to rescue her along with a troop of human soldiers. The brother was a witch, and we fought until a dragon appeared out of thin air. A dragon? May gasped. What happened? Lore laughed softly to himself. The dragon was just a baby, and he was trapped in human form for some reason. He apparently used some potions from the Brother Witch to transport, and then used fire. The witch was part of his horde, so the dragon had come to save him. Cutest little thing and so attached to his witch. So, of course, I had to let the girl go home, since she has a family and all that. But the leader of the humans wasn't too happy with me. Should we be worried? May asked, biting her lip as she spoke. Lore shook his head. They weren't interested in going after us. He warned us to stop kidnapping witches, but otherwise we're safe. So that plan is finished, May said, not sounding too disappointed at the prospect. Lore nodded. We'll figure something out, he replied strongly, but Cam could hear the worry in his voice. We will, May replied. She turned away from Lore to see Cam stirring the giant pot over the fire. Cam, who left you in charge of the food? She asked as she jogged over to him. Kara said all I had to do was stir, Cam replied. He didn't know what to think about the overheard conversation. There wouldn't be any more people taken to the clans against their will in the hopes that they were a witch, but he was worried that the humans or the dragons might decide to retaliate in some way. Cam didn't want his new home in trouble or under attack. Kara should have called me over, May groused. 
Why don't you go find a brush? That runt of yours is looking a little bedraggled. She finished with a nod of her head towards Runt, who was sleeping on her back, all four paws in the air, at Cam's feet. The day ended with everyone exhausted, Lore most of all. It was his job to melt all the snow that couldn't be moved by hand so the camp could be properly set up again. Even Cam, who had continued doing odd jobs throughout the day, was tired. He stumbled in the direction of his tent, only remembering he was bunking with Lore when all he saw was an empty plot of snow where his tent used to be. Lore's tent was considerably older than most of the other tents in the clan, and it was fancifully painted on the outside. No one would mistake the outside of Lore's tent as belonging to someone unimportant. Cam had never been inside before, but as he pushed back the flaps and stepped in, he saw that the interior was just as pretty. Lore also had woven rugs hung along the tent walls and floor to help keep the cold out. Cam was alone in the tent at the moment as Laura was still working on the last corner of the camp. He took the opportunity to change into his sleeping pants and rearrange the sleeping furs so there was enough room for two people to spread out comfortably while still staying warm. Then he sat down to wait and tried not to think too hard about what sharing a tent with Laura meant. He had wanted Laura from the first moment he had ever seen those brilliant blue eyes, but Laura had always held back. Lore had finally made the decision to be with Cam, and Cam didn't know what he felt. Through the weeks living in the camp, he had taken the opportunity to study Lore as a person, and Cam liked what he saw a lot. Lore was, quite simply, the perfect man, and Cam wanted to keep Lore and never let him go. But he didn't know if Lore planned on keeping him, too. The tent flaps were pushed aside, and Lore stepped into the tent. He gave Cam a tired smile as he moved to his clothing trunk and began to change. It takes a lot of magic to keep this place alive, Lore explained. You have no idea how grateful I am that your powers are helping out. My powers? Cam asked, trying not to drool when Lore pulled off his shirt, and Cam got a glimpse of Lore's sculpted back and broad shoulders. You're not a witch, Lore agreed with the skepticism in Cam's voice. But you are an animal speaker. Cam just shook his head in bewilderment. I'm a what? Cam asked. Lore finally took a seat next to Cam on the sleeping furs. There is an ancient tale about the magical forest known as the Wilds, where creatures with magical abilities live. There used to be a people who could speak with those animals, but they became greedy and tried to use their powers for control rather than understanding. Incensed, the animals forced the animal speakers out of the Wilds. No one knows what happened to them afterwards. And since this is usually just a bedtime story, I don't know if those people really existed. But my guess is they moved to the human city and forgot they were animal speakers over the generations. You're what's left of their tribe, Lore finished as he gently reached forward to brush Cam's hair off his forehead. I can't speak to animals, Cam gasped, even though he was annoyed that Lore was trying to tie yet another witch power on him. Cam couldn't help leaning into that gentle touch. You help that idiot puppy, Runt when she wanders too far away from her mother. You can find an injured hawk in the middle of the ice wastes, and you can get lost in a blizzard and have a sled dog guide you to safety. If that isn't speaking with animals, I don't know what other definition to give it. No one else can accomplish the same things you can. Lore finished with a smile for the perplexed Cam. If you say so, Cam finally sighed. Lore could believe what he wanted. Lore tilted Cam's head slightly and gave Cam a knowing smile. You'll see. Lore breathed softly as his own head moved closer. Their lips met gently. Lore was barely putting any pressure against Cam's lips, and it took Cam a long moment to realize that Lore was waiting for Cam to deepen the kiss. Cam pressed forward, his tongue slipping between his lips to caress Lore's closed mouth. Lore's own lips parted and his tongue met Cam's with a gentle caress that quickly grew heated as their tongues battled for dominance. Lore pushed Cam back to lie down on top of the sleeping furs, his own large body covering Cam's and pushing him deeper into the fur. Their lips never parted as they breathed harshly through their noses, but the kiss never progressed further. Lore was watching for Cam to take the initiative again. Was Lore afraid that Cam didn't want more? Lore wasn't pressuring Cam in any way, but he was still leaving it totally up to Cam to go only as far as Cam was comfortable. Well, Cam felt up to going quite a bit further than kissing. 
Cam brought his hands up to stroke along those wonderful back muscles he had glimpsed just minutes earlier, feeling just how strong and sculpted Lore was after decades of constant hard work. Cam's hands caressed over Lore's broad shoulders and down to his chest, where he found Lore's nipples. Lore gasped, and their lips parted for a brief moment as Lore arched his back at the sensation of Cam tweaking those hardened nubs. Once Lore regained his senses, he returned the favor and Cam was the one moaning and pulling away from their kiss in his ecstasy. I'm too exhausted to go much further, Lore admitted as his lips moved to caress Cam's ear. His hard length was pressed against Cam's thigh, so Cam knew Lore was more than willing, but the hard day had taken its toll on them both. Cam reached out to run his fingers down Lore's length, gratified when Lore gasped. So I'll touch you and you touch me. Cam said in a voice breathy with anticipation as he freed Lore from his sleeping pants and felt Lore's fingers fumbling with the hem of Cam's. I like the sound of that, Lore agreed as he finally wrapped his big hand around Cam. The next few minutes were filled with mutual moans and gasps as their arms pumped and their fingers squeezed. It wasn't long before Cam's back was arching and he was whimpering Lore's name as he came all over Lore's hand. Lore followed soon after, burying his face in Cam's shoulder to muffle his cry. They lay together afterwards, sticky, sated, and tired, panting together on the soiled fur. After five minutes, Lore was finally able to roll to his knees. He stuck one hand outside the tent flap and returned with a handful of snow. He grabbed a bit of cloth and used it and the snow to carefully wipe them and the furs clean. Then he helped tuck them both snugly underneath the fur and pulled Cam into his arms. Lore fell asleep first, which gave Cam a chance to see Lore's sated and happy face. Cam's heart gave a thump with just the thought that the wonderful man in his arms was his to keep. Cam wanted Lore, but as more than just bedmates. As sleep pulled Cam under, he couldn't help smiling because he got the feeling that Lore wanted their relationship to be much more, too. Being kidnapped and taken to the ice wastes was definitely the best thing that had ever happened to Cam. Part 4 Cam was just finishing in the kennel the next morning when Tom came up to him. Tom was carrying a hooded falcon and even from a few yards away, Cam could tell something wasn't quite right. He had spent the morning listening to the dogs, their happiness to see him, their satisfaction when food was delivered, and their various desires all crowded into Cam's head. Cam had never thought about the fact that he could hear what animals wanted before. It was just another facet of his life and was something he had always done. But with Laura's story about animal speakers in his mind, Cam was beginning to realize that it wasn't normal to be able to communicate with animals the way he could. Maybe Laura was right and Cam really had a special type of power? May told me to find you, Tom said when he caught up to Cam. Talon here has been off his feed for a few days. We've been trying everything we can think of to get him to eat, but nothing is working. I can't hunt with him like this, and I'm worried he'll die. May said you would be able to tell me what's wrong with him. Cam nodded. He was pretty sure what was wrong with Talon already, but he reached out gently to touch the bird's stomach first to double-check. Talon's been chewing on the paint in his perch, hasn't he? Cam asked even though he already knew the answer. It's given him a bit of a stomachache. A few days of rest and a perch where he can't bite the paint off and he'll be just fine. Talon gave a soft cry as Tam ruffled his fingers through the stiff chest feathers. Tom nodded thoughtfully as he studied his bird. He has been clawing at his perch lately, Tom said. Thanks, I'll get that fixed. Cam watched as Tom and Talon walked off with a frown on his face. It was definitely clear that the things Cam could feel from animals were deeply out of the ordinary. He mulled over the idea throughout the day as he went about his various chores and waited for Lore and the rest of the hunters to return. It surprised him to see just how many of the dogs stopped by to say hello wherever he was in the camp. First Runt flopped down on his feet and then other dogs came by for a petting. When the hunters returned, Cam was one of the people who helped unhitch the dogs and he found that his sleds were done well before the ones anyone else was helping with simply because the dogs were much more cooperative with Cam than with anyone else. When he climbed under the furs with Lore that night, Cam was almost totally convinced. He had some sort of connection or power with animals. It was a comforting thought to know that he wasn't just extra baggage for the clan any longer. Cam really could help with everything animal-related. 
He went to sleep curled in Laura's arms with a small smile on his face at the thought. Morning dawned and Cam woke as Laura began disentangling their furs so he could get dressed for the day. Cam hurried into his warm clothing and stepped into the blindingly blue day, braced for the icy wind that buffeted him along. He walked to the kennels to start feeding the dogs, their hunger beginning to press on his mind. As usual, Hearn already had the door open when Cam arrived. Cam took his time with the feeding, making sure that each dog got their share of food and an equal amount of time getting petted. Once he finished helping Hearn clean the building properly, Cam headed over to the fire for breakfast. It's a good day today, May said as a greeting to Cam when he arrived in front of the communal pot of food. She handed him a bowl and ladled some of the porridge inside as she spoke. We'll get a lot of tanning done today. Lots of furs to sell in the market this fall. That sounds good, May. Cam replied as he searched for a spoon. I'll need you to help stretch the skin, so don't travel far. May added, pointing a clean spoon in his direction to emphasize her point. Cam nodded and took the spoon. I'll be right over there. He said with a shrug towards the rock beside the fire where Lor was sitting to eat his own breakfast. May nodded, but turned her attention to Hearn, who had also come for breakfast. Lore moved over to give Cam room to sit, and then occasionally brushed his arm against Cam as they both sat in comfortable silence. Runt and her littermates wandered over with their mother to sit by the fire, too. Lore had been finished eating for a while by the time Cam finally set aside his bowl, but Lore waited patiently. I'll be on the other side of camp, he explained. They found... But Cam never learned what had been found or by whom because Lor's eyes shot wide and he jumped to his feet. Weapons! Lor shouted as he pushed Cam behind him. Bows and spears usually reserved for hunting suddenly appeared and the clan's members who knew how to use them were quick to arm themselves. Lor was staring at an empty patch of snow, trampled flat and slightly brown by dozens of boots but otherwise totally unremarkable. In the back of his mind, Cam thought he felt the twinge of an animal of some sort coming closer. But the focused worry on Lore's face made Cam push the twinge away in favor of the more immediate fear. Cam watched as those holding weapons circled the empty space. There was something coming into focus in the middle of their circle. Cam couldn't tell what it was because the image was so hazy. Slowly it began to resolve itself, and Cam could see that there were two somethings arriving by some sort of magical means. Suddenly the image snapped into focus. Cam could see two people holding tight to each other in the middle of the cleared space. One had hair that was a strange mixture of gold and red colors. A bright red ruby hung around his neck. The other had light brown hair and his eyes were blue. A topaz hung around the second man's neck, clearly visible when he looked up in alarm. See, Jenny? I told you it would work. The strangely colored one chirped happily. Define work, Tori. The brown-haired one, Jenny, snapped. The first young man, Tori, finally looked up and his golden-colored eyes widened comically. Oh, whoops. Beside Cam, Laura started snorting with laughter. <laughs> Next time, just announce that you're coming first, he called, waving down the fighters as he stepped forward. May quickly joined Laura as he walked up to the two strangers. I'm sorry, Tori sniffled. To Cam's surprise, it almost seemed like Tori was about to cry. Cam could feel a sort of upset contrition from the childlike Tori. Jerny pulled Tori into his arms and patted Tori gently on the back. It's all right, just a bit of a scare. Welcome to the tribe of the White Dragon, Lore replied in a placating tone. You are a witch and a dragon, but I don't believe I ever caught your names. In a sudden emotional turnaround, Tori bounced forwards. I'm a dragon. My name is Antatari. Call me Tori. This is my journey, and he's my witch, Tori added as he pulled Journey forward by the arm. What's your name, and who's the white dragon? My name is Lore. This is May, Lore replied, pointing to May standing beside him as he spoke. And the white dragon was our leader and caretaker centuries ago. Oh, Tori grumbled with a pout. I wanted to meet him. I've never met a white dragon before. Mama Gale is the only red dragon anymore, but even Toel never mentioned a white dragon. The constant stream of information lacking almost totally in context had more than just Cam wishing for Tori to elaborate instead of continuing to babble. Jerny, clearly used to the dragon's behavior, reached up and placed a gentle hand over Tori's mouth. 
The babble cut off suddenly, but Tori didn't look the least bit abashed. Instead, Cam thought Tori felt intensely curious about everything around him. We are here to ask you for your help, Jeremy explained. Well, May cut in, this calls for some tea. She glanced around the circle of watchers critically before continuing. Kara, make the tea. Cam, guide our guests to the communal tent. This way, Cam said as he stepped forward. Everyone else quickly dispersed, but Cam had no doubt that the rumor mill would be running rampant until the full story of why the two strangers had suddenly appeared came clear. Cam led Jerny and Tori away from the main fire into the area where the largest tents were set up. The communal tent was in the very center of the camp where it could be shared and used by anyone for anything. Are you some sort of god? Jerny asked politely as they settled onto cushions on the floor to one side of the tent, well away from anything else stored there. On the other side of the tent, some of the women were setting up frames to stretch skins, but this little sitting area was kept clear for anyone to use. Cam couldn't stop a quick laugh from escaping. I'm from the human city, so I'm probably the most used to dragons out of all of us, he began explaining before he was forced to stop. Tori had left the security of Jerny's arms and was slowly creeping closer to Cam. Those bright golden eyes were fixed on Cam's face. Tori felt curious and so very young to Cam. He wasn't an animal, not entirely. There was more human in him than in the white dragon frozen in the mountains. Cam wondered if that was because Tori was in human form, or if something else was odd about him. "'What are you?' Tori asked, tilting his head slightly to get a better angle to stare. Cam giggled awkwardly. "'I, I think I'm an animal speaker, which means I can understand animals. You're nothing like the white dragon, though.' "'An animal speaker?' Jerny asked, surprise clear in his tone. "'I thought those were just the bedtime story.' "'You've met the White Dragon?' Tori asked, curious and almost vibrating in place in excitement. "'Can I meet him?' "'Lor thought it was just a bedtime story, too, before he met me,' Cam answered Jerny. "'The White Dragon is frozen in ice in the mountain range, so I didn't meet him, really,' he added to Tori. Tori spun around and bounced back over to Jerny. "'Hey, Jerny, can we go see the White Dragon before we go home?' That's probably not a good idea, Lors said as he pushed through the tent flap and walked over to join them. It's a difficult journey over a lot of ice. May pushed through a moment after Lor, holding the tea. There was a pause in conversation as everyone took a cup and settled onto the cushions. Lor spoke up first. May, come. Jenny and Tori are the two I met before the snowstorm. Jenny had come to rescue his sister, and Tori came to rescue Jenny. We had a bit of a disagreement, but the matter was resolved. Why? He asked as he turned to where Jerny and Tori were curled up on the same cushion. Have you come here then? King Felix and Prince Bast have given Tori and me a task to complete, Jerny explained. They don't appreciate the fact that all the witches in the city have haphazard training, and that there is no force to regulate their actions. They want me to set up a school where witches can train and learn rules on proper use of their powers. We don't want another witch like Harold to be able to take advantage of the crown without repercussions or a proper policing force to stop him before he became violent. So I went to talk to Toel, Tori cut in. He's my hatchfather, and he said he'd organize some dragons to fly around and look for a good place to start building. They're going to make me a big hoard room. They found a perfect place just north of the royal forest, Jerny continued. It has a very large hill they can hollow out for Tory's hoard room, a large flat area nearby to build the actual school on, and a good access route to the city. The only issue is that Endedon and Bane have found a small house and barn already on the site with an older man in residence. He directed us to speak with you. I was already hoping to ask if you would come teach at the school, but now I also want to know if we can take up your hill. We'll make sure there is an area kept there for you and for the man watching your horses, but we don't want to start building without your permission. Every fall, before winter confines us to our camp, we go south to trade our furs for the goods necessary for our survival, May explained. That hut is our stopover point between the human city and the ice wastes. We cannot survive without it. But on the same token, Laura cut in, 
We could benefit from a closer human settlement to trade with. I cannot leave my clan, because without a witch they would be defenseless on the wastes. May and I will have to discuss this ourselves before we can give you any decision. I understand. We don't need a decision today, but we would like to have the foundation built before winter, Journey explained. I can mention to the king that perhaps a more permanent trade route could be set up, and I would be very willing to send students to you here for training. We can work out all the details as we go along. They finished the tea, and Cam was left in charge of entertaining the two guests, while Laura and May called a meeting of the elders in the clan. Cam decided to show them around the camp. He led them back to the main fire. Do you need a coat? Cam asked Journey as they reached the flames, and Journey quickly held out his hands. Journey was dressed warmly, but without thick furs he could easily get frostbite. Tori headed off to the other side of the fire as they spoke. He started giggling happily a few moments later, so Cam didn't worry. I'm using a bit of magic to keep myself warm, Journey admitted. And I know you've never hugged a dragon before, but when their internal flame is burning, they tend to run a little hot. You're using a dragon as your coat? Cam said with a snort of laughter, remembering the way Tori had clung to Journey so tightly. There had been something more than warmth in that embrace, though, something that showed a deeper connection that, while not sexual, had all the makings of a future relationship blooming. Hey, Jenny! Tori called as he trotted back around the fire. In his arms was an unhappily squirming Runt and one of Runt's brothers. Can I keep one? Before Cam could say anything, Jenny stepped forward and took Runt out of Tori's hands. Not this one. She's already bonded to Cam. If you want the other one, you'll have to ask Laura and May first. For now, put him down. Runt got all four paws underneath her with as much dignity as a puppy with her eyes barely opened could do and toddled quickly to Cam's side, her nose working furiously to locate Cam. She collapsed at Cam's feet with a grunt and a glare in Tori's direction. All right, Tori sighed. He gently put the other puppy down who quickly headed back in the direction of his mother and reattached himself to Jenny's side. So where is this white dragon again? Tori asked. The feeling of stubborn curiosity flared again. Cam couldn't stop his grimace and wondered just how Tori's parents managed to keep him in line. Probably with judicious use of Journey's patience, Cam assumed as Journey gently cuffed Tori on the side of his head. That's not why we're here, Journey admonished. Tori pouted, his lower lip jutting invitingly in Journey's direction. Cam watched as Jerny's face softened in the face of Tori's onslaught. Before Jerny could break down entirely, Cam spoke up. It's about a two-hour sled ride in that direction, Cam explained as he pointed towards the snow-capped mountains in the distance. Cam had asked May how far the mountain range was from the camp, and apparently when you weren't trying to frantically outrun a blizzard, it was a lengthy trek. Their return trip back at an easier pace had taken two hours. You would need a sled, some dogs, and someone to show you the way. See? Journey said gently to Tori, smoothing his hand down Tori's head as the pouting continued. It's much too difficult. It's actually not a bad idea. Lor's voice came from behind Cam. Lor's arm came to rest around Cam's shoulders as he drew Cam into his chest. Tomorrow we've called a clan meeting, which would be very boring for you both to sit out for. I can provision a sled and send you on a day trip to see Old White. It would be easy enough for you to have lunch in the caves and be back before nightfall. We could? Tori asked, bouncing excitedly in place. Can we, Jenny? Jenny laughed. If Law says it's okay, then it might be fun. Jenny agreed. Excellent, Lor said with a smile. Cam, if you would go with them, I know they won't get lost. I'll send Hern to guide the sled. Is that okay? Cam nodded, strangely pleased with the idea that Laura was willing to let him go alone. Considering all the admonitions Cam had received from Lore about safety in the snow and Laura's worry about Cam's health, it was flattering to know that Lore still trusted Cam to take care of himself and their important guests. It'll be fun, Cam said with his own smile at Lore. Um, Tori said shyly. Cam turned away from Lore and almost jumped. Tori was standing about three inches away and was gazing hopefully up at Lore. Can I have a puppy? He asked carefully. Journey groaned. During dinner, Tori spent the time fluttering around and introducing himself to the clan. 
Breakfast the next morning led to more of the same as Tori fought to meet every single person around the fire at least once. Cam could tell the clan was absolutely charmed by the childlike dragon. Jeremy just watched and smiled, which made Cam wonder just why such a peculiar duo had been sent to ask the clans for help. Certainly there must be other qualified people with connections to the human king, and any dragon a little older than Tori could have spoken just as diplomatically about the issues as Jeremy. Yet every time Tori came gambling by, talking a mile a minute and looking so excited about the snow and the tents and everything else in the camp, Cam couldn't help smiling and laughing along with Tori. It wasn't an act either. Cam could feel Tori's genuine excitement and happiness reverberating in his wake. Cam couldn't help wondering if the clan might vote on behalf of Tori just to keep Tori from losing his overwhelming cheer. And that thought led to all the answer Cam needed about why Tori and Jerny had been the ones sent. An adult dragon or a trained envoy would have set the clan on edge. But a baby and his keeper did the exact opposite. There was someone very shrewd in either the human court or the dragon mountain dictating behind the scenes. Cam hooked the last sled dog into the harness of their sled and gave all six pairs of fluffy ears a good rub. Hearn had finished lashing their supplies down to the sled and was demonstrating to Tori and Jerny how to hold on to the safety straps. You'll be careful, Laura admonished as he wrapped his arms around Cam's waist from behind. Cam craned his neck upwards and smiled at Laura. I won't go running off into the snow by myself. It's two hours there... Two hours for lunch and to see Old White, and two hours back. We'll be home before the sun starts to set. Good, Lor said. He bent down and pressed his lips against Cam's. Cam felt some sort of spell thrum through him at the contact, but Lor didn't pull away after the sensation faded. The kiss deepened, Cam's tongue eagerly meeting with Lor's even in the awkward position. They finally drew apart. Lor kept one hand on Cam's shoulder for a long moment before he nodded resolutely and walked off towards the central fire. Cam watched him go for a long second before turning and climbing onto the sled. That's quite a protection spell, Jerny murmured. He must care about you a lot. We're sharing a tent, Cam explained with a shrug, warmed by the knowledge of just how much Lor cared about him. To waste so much magic just to keep Cam safe? They set off, Hearn guiding the sled out of the camp and pointing the dogs towards the mountains. Tori was almost vibrating with excitement, clearly trying to rein himself in and not bounce on the sled and disturb the dogs. The journey had one hand casually pressed on Tori's shoulder as a reminder. It wasn't long before they were adrift in an endless sea of snow, only the mountains in the distance giving them a landmark to follow. It was a long two hours for Cam before they were suddenly in the shadow of the mountain, the sled gliding up through the final curve into the entrance of the caves. Wow! Tori gasped when the immense opening came into view. Looks just like the mountain at home. Definitely a dragon cave. Jeremy agreed. Hearn stopped the sled outside the opening, where it could stay safely on top of the snowpack. I'll stay with the dogs, Hearn grunted. Cam, you know the way? Cam nodded. I'll show them. Tori was already inside the mountain, heading off down the corridor by the time Cam led Jerny inside. Tori stopped at a far turnoff, looked both ways with a small frown, and bounced back to Jerny's side when he couldn't decide which way to go. Cam led them along the left-hand turn and into the gigantic cave that housed the clan during terrible weather. The large room looked different without the small clan inside, but there was no mistaking the space for somewhere else. The fire pit was cut in the center of the main cave, evidence of a recent fire still inside, and nearby the charcoal drawings of the tribe's few children remained. This looks like the eldest's meeting room, Tori said as he looked around. No pretties or treasures to magic anywhere. It could just have been emptied of treasure at some point, Jeremy pointed out. He was studying the cave carefully, his hand brushing along the wall where Lore's protection spell kept out the snow and cold. The white dragon is this way, Cam explained, leading Tori and Jerny across the cave towards the uneven wall. They all slid through the opening into the smaller room, eerily lit from within the ice. Tori sucked in an excited breath and rushed to press his hands against the wall of ice, staring at the gemstones encased inside. If Tori had a tail, it would be wagging, 
Cam thought as waves of curiosity tried to do battle with the loneliness that pervaded the room. Cam decided to let Tori find White on his own. It wasn't long before Tori let out another gasp, standing right in front of White's sleeping place. He tried knocking on the ice and calling out a few times, but that didn't have any effect. Hey, Jenny, Tori asked without turning around. I can already see all the spells that have been tried, Jenny explained gently. I don't believe there is anything I can do. Tori grumbled and frowned, then took a deep breath. That's probably not a good idea either, Jenny cautioned. Cam had no idea what was going on, but he could feel how resolute Tori was about trying to get White free. Cam thought about explaining that the tribe had been attempting the same thing for centuries to no avail, but Tori also had stubbornness coming out of him in waves so Cam didn't bother trying. We should probably take a step back, Jenny explained to Cam. In what should probably be described as a cough rather than a proper exhale of breath, Tori spewed out flames from his mouth. He missed the ice the first time, which made him frown and take another deep breath. Try number two was dead on, pressing against the unmelting ice and spraying off in all directions. Jerny was quick to wave his hand and quench the flames that came too close to where he and Cam were standing. Tori ran out of breath quickly and took a step back to survey his efforts. The ice looked unmarred, and Tori's shoulders slumped. This is weird ice, Tori grumbled, turning his head towards Jerny with the pout on his face. All of a sudden there was a loud groan and a cracking sound. Cam felt the loneliness vanish to be replaced with something that felt like hope quickly stifled. Tori backpedaled until he was gripping Jarney's arm. Then, the ice melted. Piles of gemstones and jewelry were revealed first as the ice dripped away far too quickly to be caused by anything but magic. Then the massive white head began to emerge. Tori crept forward, crouching down next to the head as the ice began to flow away from the neck and body behind it. Cam decided to stay next to Jerny, who was mumbling potions ingredients to himself under his breath and had his hands at the ready to cast a spell. Slowly, one eye cracked open, but it closed too quickly for Cam to get more than an impression of a flash of gold. A moment later, White groaned and two forelegs came into view as the bulk of his body shivered in a long stretch. Then both eyes opened. White's irises were pure gold, exactly like Tori's eyes, but his pupils were white instead of the standard black. He looked upwards from his position on the ground to where Tori was crouched approximately five inches from the end of White's nose. You are a curious youngling, White said in a gravelly voice tight with disuse. He spoke slowly and formally, as if every word held more gravity than normal. That's what Toel says all the time. Tori said with a happy nod of agreement. Except I've never been able to tell if he's making fun of my hair color, Tori added with a pout. You are strangely colored for a dragon, White agreed. Mama Gale says that I'm prettier than other dragons. Tori agreed with another wide grin. And Tatuel and Anna Gale were both mere hatchlings at the time of the driving, White replied with a frown. Now you are there, hatchling? I'm number two, Tori chirped. Nile, um, Anna Nile is my big brother, but he's off playing with his werewolf right now. Curious indeed, White murmured. Now, why have you woken me, hatchling? My name is Tori, and I wanted to say hi, Tori explained. You shouldn't be hiding inside ice anyway, Tori explained, his reasoning no doubt making sense in his own mind. Right, Jenny? Tori asked. Jerny just sighed, hiding laughter behind one hand. White's head finally lifted off the ground and turned on his long neck to look where Jerny and Cam were standing. You are not one of mine, White said thoughtfully to Jerny. Jerny shook his head, but Tori gasped angrily. Jerny's mine, Tori snapped. You can't steal him. No more stealing. Very well, Antatori. White agreed with infinite patience in his slow voice. You, he added as his bright eyes caught on Cam, are also not one of mine, but one of mine has seen to your protections. Heartening news to know one of mine still lives. 
one of yours? Cam asked, trying to figure out the mix of emotions coming off of White. Tori's feelings were mixing with White's too, which made it more difficult, but Cam thought that much of the loneliness that had plagued White for so long was abating under Tori's continued cheer. My horde, White explained with a great sigh. I was once known as the White Witch, my horde the Ice Witches of the tribe. Cam shook his head sadly. There's only two left, he tried to explain gently. Instead of looking shocked or worried, White just nodded. I knew what would happen should I sequester myself, but my ire could not be given outlet. To do so would raise the mountain and destroy the fields of ice. So you buried yourself alone in the mountains? Jeremy asked, echoing Cam's curiosity out loud. Awaiting the day a dragon would come to mend the riving, White agreed. And now Antatori has arrived. Um, Tori began slowly. I just wanted to get you out. What's arriving? White turned his head sharply towards Tori. You have not been educated, he asked, sounding incredulous. Um, Tori repeated. Mama Gale decided she didn't want to squish me, so she sent me to the humans. I could ask Toel, he added. We could easily send a message to Antatuel or Ananol about this, Jeremy agreed. Do so, White ordered. I wish to understand what has occurred during my centuries of sleep. Take me to the Ice Witch who protects you so diligently, he added to Cam. Okay, Cam agreed, because there really wasn't anything else he could say. White looked at the three human-sized men standing below his gigantic head, snorted, and shifted into human form. He had long white hair, intricately braided with feathers and stones, just like all the tribe members Cam had ever seen, and looked to be about thirty years of age. His gold eyes with the odd pupil remained the same in his handsome face. Cam led the way back out of the caves towards where Hearn was waiting with their lunches and the sled. Tori skipped happily at White's side, holding tightly to Jerny's hand as he went. Cam decided that dragons were really weird creatures. Powerful and scary, certainly, but their personalities were decidedly weird. They stepped back out of the caves in a large group. Hearn caught sight of them and dropped the fur he was rearranging. His mouth opened in shock. White? He asked, his eyes wide and fixed on White. You are of the tribe, White agreed with a formal nod. I wish to speak with your ice witch, he added while climbing carefully aboard the sled. All right, Hearn agreed, flashing a curious look over at Cam, who pointed at Tori and tried to make fire gestures with his fingers. Hearn just shook his head and moved to climb onto the driver's perch at the back of the sled. Part 5 the ride back was silent, Tori curled in Jerny's arms. All of them took turns trying to covertly stare at the white dragon sitting calmly in the middle of the sled, although Tori's stare was less covert and more awed. They pulled into camp well ahead of schedule, which brought both Lore and May running. Is everything okay? Lore asked Cam as Cam stood from the sled first. Sort of? Cam asked, waving his hand towards white. Lore froze in place, his gaze caught on the dragon in human form slowly freeing himself from the safety straps. Oh, I've sent a message to Toel and Nile, Jerny murmured to Lore and May as he and Tori joined Cam at Lore's side. They've had some idea of how to handle this. You are one of mine, White said gravelly as he studied Lore. But this is not the Ice City, he added as he glanced around the tents and the camp. The city was lost in a great blizzard centuries ago, Lore explained, finally coming to his senses. More members of the clan were drifting over, curious about the commotion. Half the tribe was lost and the rest forced to live in a large camp like you see here. Eventually the camp splintered into two. Today only those two clans and two witches remain. I shall look into the city's location, White mused. And arriving? he asked. The dragons remain separated. Their human city thrives at the base of their mountains. More we have been unable to learn, Lore replied. The dragons and the humans have an alliance with the werewolves and the magi from the wilds, Jerny added. 
And they are currently trying to organize the witches from the human city also. Only the tribe remains separated, White snorted. The driving remains. Actually, Journey cut in politely again. I don't think the humans knew there were people living in the far north before a week or so ago. They knew there were fur trappers working the tundra, but not living here permanently. I can't speak for the dragons, but two should be flying here soon who can explain. I shall wait then, White agreed. They didn't have to wait long. They all settled by the fire, Tori held in place by Journey, Lore with his arms wrapped protectively around Cam, and White staring patiently into the flames. The first exclamations of surprise came through the camp as two golden dragons flew overhead and circled in to land just on the outskirts of the tents. Cam saw a man with long black hair climb off one of the dragons before both golden dragons shifted into human form. The smaller dragon took the black-haired man's hand and led the way over to the fire. Tori, what have you done now? The smaller dragon asked sharply, but with a gentleness in his voice that kept Tori from doing more than pout. Nile, Tori whined. Introduce us, Nile added. Tori nodded and then bounced to his feet. This is my big brother Nile, his werewolf, Prince Leon, and my hatchfather Toel. This is Law and Cam, May, and this is White. White? Toel gasped. His emotions felt contained to Cam's senses, although surprise flared suddenly when he saw White. Thou art White Witch? We thought thou lost. Lost? White asked. Certainly that is an apt term. However, I was riven, not lost, when Eldest abandoned me. In my ire and sorrow, I froze myself in my horde room, awaiting the day Eldest saw fit to end the riving. I've never heard of a riving. Nile interjected, his emotional sense also seemingly calm, although there was a larger sense of wildness to him that echoed Tori's childishness. Cam thought the rougher sense to Nile might have more to do with Leon than with Nile's relationship to Tori. Leon felt wolf-like and wild underneath his human exterior to Cam, and had some sort of deep, binding connection to Nile. But I bet the eldest knows. So what do we do? Leon asked curiously. Speak with the eldest, certainly, Toel murmured. We must learn the circumstances of this thriving and strive to end it. Tori nodded emphatically. White's really nice, and the eldest lets me play with his rubies. They'll be great friends. He turned towards White and smiled. You should come with us. I'll show you Jenny's store and my hoard in the castle. And you can see where the werewolves live in the royal forest, and you can come play with the eldest's rubies too. Such optimism, White said. Niall was busy trying to hide a smile behind one hand, and Towell looked particularly stiff-necked at Tori's declaration. That sounds like a great idea, Leon said, his own voice filled with no small amount of hidden mirth. But White shook his head. I dare not approach eldest until the riving has ended. He must come to me to formally end our separation. Uh-oh, Tori said with a pout. The eldest doesn't leave the mountain, ever. He paused to think further about the problem, but couldn't seem to come up with an answer. Toel and I will go speak with the eldest, Niall said to Tori and White. What about the negotiations? Journey asked, sounding like he thought that maybe it wasn't the time to bring it up, but also knowing that if he didn't remind everyone of their original purpose in the ice wastes, it would be forgotten. We agree that creating this school could be beneficial for our tribe, May replied. We would need to hammer out the particulars, including the possibilities of increased trade and which is coming to stay with the tribe for training. But as a basic idea, the tribe has agreed. Toel nodded. Very well. Thou must have a dialogue with Nile, who will speak on behalf of the dragons. I believe Bast wished to speak on behalf of the humans, as this is his endeavor. Shall I inform him that he might meet with thou at the location in question in four days? That is a very long time for Laura and I to be away from the clan, May said sharply. We need Lore to keep an eye on the weather. White craned his neck, glancing in all directions for a long moment. There are no storms on the horizon for at least a week, 
Your charges should be safe for duration of this meeting. I wish to search for the other living clan and for the lost ice city. I shall also meet at this location in four days. In four days, then. Niall agreed, seeing Lor, May, and Toel nod agreement. Niall, Leon, and Toel said their goodbyes to Tori and the tribe before walking out of the camp into the wide expanse of snow. Niall and Toel shifted into dragon form a moment later. Toel took to the air, but Niall waited for Leon to climb onto his back and get settled before he joined Toel. Both dragons flew sharply south and were gone from sight in a few minutes. White also nodded his goodbye. I must fly as well, he explained. In four days we shall speak again about what is to be done to revive the tribe of the White Dragon. With that final statement, White also walked out of the clearing where he shifted form and jumped into the sky. His white coloring made him blend into the pale-colored sky until he vanished. Laura looked at May, shock clear on his face. She shrugged helplessly. We should begin preparing to journey south as well, she finally said as if she didn't know what else to talk about. The sudden appearance of White as well as the revelation that the tribe might be saved either because of White's power or because of the trade agreement about to be discussed in a few days, seemed to leave her mostly speechless. Cam understood the sentiment. After spending much of his life destitute and unhappy, he had never expected to see a dragon, let alone speak with one. In the space of two days he had spoken with four dragons and a prince and was living happily with a witch. He wasn't sure what to expect anymore. The tension around the central fire broke suddenly when there was a thump and Jerny started spluttering. Cam looked over and saw clumps of melting snow dripping off Jerny's face. Tori was giggling a few feet away where he was crouched down gathering another ball of snow. Oh no you won't! Jerny laughed. He was quick to drop down and gather his own ball of snow, firing it off at Tori before Tori could finish. The snowball hit Tori directly in the face and melted almost immediately, leaving the baby dragon blinking water out of his sparkling golden eyes. Tori grinned widely and flung the snowball he hadn't dropped, hitting Jerny in the chest, before taking off at a run, giggling wildly the entire time. Jerny just laughed and bent to gather more snow before taking off after Tori. That is an interesting pair, May murmured softly as they heard Tori squeal happily behind one of the tents further away. I like them. She added before mashing a handful of snow directly into Lore's shocked face. She lifted her heavy woolen skirts and took off at a jog, but Lore just wiped his face and grinned over at Cam while his magic compacted some snow behind him. Cam, who had seen what May was doing while Lore was distracted with Tori, grinned back and shoved his own handful of snow up Lore's nose. He took off running with a laugh as well, Lore's enraged cry echoing behind. The rest of the afternoon passed quite pleasantly, most of the tribe participating in the impromptu snow fight. By the time Cam and Lore slid under their furs that night, much of the worry that had plagued the tribe after the arrival of the older dragons had faded. In the morning they would begin preparations for the journey south, but for the moment all they wanted was to have some fun. When Lore rolled over and took Cam's mouth with his, Cam smiled. Fun, indeed. We're going to dig out this hill, Tori was explaining outside of the small barn. The large hill the barn and accompanying small house were tucked underneath had attracted Tori's attention. And my horde will go inside. Then they're going to build a school and attach the two. My horde room is going to be nicer than Niles. The hill wasn't large enough to house a full-grown dragon. Cam knew that much even as he nodded along with May in response to Tori's exuberance. The little he had seen of White's dragon form and the sheer size of Nile, only a few hundred years older than Tori, told Cam that the hill might suffice as a horde room for a century. Any longer and Tori would be too large in dragon form. Although, none of those worries might ever become an issue for Tori. Cam had learned a lot about Tori over the last few days, since the baby dragon never stopped talking. Apparently, Tori had been born in human form and couldn't yet access his dragon shape. It was entirely possible that his dragon shape would be smaller after being confined inside a human form for so long. Or it was equally likely that Tori would prefer human shape since that was how he was born and since his favorite horde piece, Jerny, was a human. According to Tori, 
Niall had started staying in human form more often once he had Leon around. Anyway, Tori seemed plenty pleased with his plans for the large hill. He was climbing to the lightly snowy hilltop, his small claws at the tips of his human fingers digging deeply into the near-frozen sod. So far south, the snow and ice coating the ground was sparser. Cam could see cold brown grass poking through the light layer of snow. It was much closer to what he remembered during winters in the city, although there was still enough snow that the sleds didn't get stuck. They're here, Tori called, waving at someone on the other side of the hill. Lore straightened his back, and May bit her lip once before hiding her nervousness away. Cam drifted behind Lore. He had just been a lowly peasant stuck living in the docks. He had no place speaking with Prince Bast, captain of the guard. Lore had brought Cam along anyway, citing his knowledge of human city customs as reason for Cam needing to be present during the negotiations as well. Tori scrambled down the hill, sliding most of the way, and came to a stop next to Journey. Soon after, the clopping of horses could be heard as six men on horseback rounded the hill. They dismounted, and the one with the fewest patches on his uniform took the reins of all the horses and guided the animals to the side. Niall and Leon walked around the hill a few moments later. No doubt Niall and Leon had flown and had landed far enough away that they didn't spook anyone. With all the members of the negotiation party present, the three groups converged in the middle. The man leading the soldiers from the city spoke first. He had cropped black hair and brilliant blue eyes, but his face and body were military straight. Cam decided to stay behind Lore while the soldier spoke. I am Prince Bast, captain of the guard in the royal forces, and have been given full authority by His Majesty King Felix to conduct these negotiations and make binding signatures on behalf of the humans. These men are all versed in this issue and may have information to share as well. He introduced the four men standing behind him, excluding the cadet unsaddling horses near where the sleds had been left. Cam couldn't read anything from the five men in front of him. None of them had animal characteristics. But one of the men standing directly behind Bast, whose name was Evan, gave off some sort of other characteristic that Cam couldn't place. Lore stepped forward next and introduced his own party, comprised of himself, Cam, May, Hearn, and Tom. The house was too small to hold all of them comfortably, and the caretaker too old to be able to accommodate them. But after a few moments scramble, there were enough furs spread on the ground that no one had to get their bottoms wet. Bast began speaking first, outlining the travesty that had nearly occurred in the city thanks to one witch with a vendetta and a total lack of safeguards against illegal magic usage, something that had apparently been an issue the king had been searching for a solution to since before his coronation. Cam was too young to remember the battle caused by the Magi, but he knew enough that he could clarify any of Lore's questions about it later. So we need a school built that can gather all the witches together in one place for proper training, and oversight protocols put in place for when they are in the city. He finished his explanation. We chose this location based on the fact that while it is near and easily accessible to the city, it is also far enough away that any spell work that goes awry, as Jenny explained, does tend to happen with young apprentices, will not impact the city negatively either. Plus, Tori cut in, the hill is big enough for a proper dragon horde. I want to move out of the basement of the castle. Yes, that too, Bast said with a touch too much agreement in his voice. Cam could guess that Tori was just as exuberant in the castle as he had been with the ice. From Bast's stiff demeanor, it was easy enough to tell that Tori's personality grated on Bast's nerves a good bit. With those aims in mind, we chose to head north into the grass hills instead of south into the plains. Lore nodded thoughtfully, but it was May who spoke. We can see many benefits to both our peoples from such an arrangement. Our chief concern is that our trade route to the human city remains unblocked. Bast nodded as well. Dragonlord Ananile and Prince Leon have brought up your concerns to our council and king. I believe we have a solution that would work well for all of us. There is a large market for exotic furs, one you are already aware of. If we opened up an official trading route, we could expand that market. Additionally, there is a need for ice blocks from the north to be shipped regularly into the city. As you can see, we have some trade agreements to work out, but I believe there is enough need for us both to make a mutually beneficial trade. May sat back in her seat and nodded, but she glanced up at Lore and didn't speak again. We wish to remain autonomous. Lore finally spoke. Your king is not our king. 
Bast didn't look surprised at that demand. That's understandable. I believe the precedent is to apply hold law? He asked, turning to Niall for confirmation, but Niall was shaking his head in the negative. That has been the stance taken with the werewolves and the magi, true, but they were not already a part of a horde. The white dragon and the eldest must come to an official decision first, but I believe that total autonomy and perhaps an official peace treaty signed by all sides would be better in this case. I can sign for the dragons, Leon for the wolves, you for the humans, Bast, and Evan can sign for the magi. He finished with a nod for the strange-feeling human in Bast's group. That is certainly an option, Bast agreed, but before he could say more, a giant shadow swooped over them, startling the sled dogs and the horses. Cam looked up and saw a flash of pale white in the sky. White had arrived as promised. A second gigantic shadow flew overhead, also high in the sky, but the shocked and frozen reaction from both Nile and Tori proved to Cam what he could already feel. Age, immense age, even older than White, and no small bit of anger. White was angry too, but the eldest's rage flared stronger. Something intense had happened between them a very long time ago, because the feelings Cam was getting from the golden speck high in the sky were deep and personal. Then the two shadows collided in mid-air. Fire flared high above, countered swiftly by a jet of ice. Claws grabbed and missed, wings beating furiously to keep them aloft and out of harm's way. Are they fighting? Tori asked, sounding horribly betrayed. It will be okay, Journey soothed softly. You fight with Bast all the time, but you still like him, he added, garnering a sharp look from Bast for the comment. Tori nodded. I just wish they would get to the making up stage already. Cam could feel pain up above and knew that someone had scored a hit. It took the blood a few seconds to hit the ground, but when it did, Niall and Tori both moaned. Toel came diving into their camp, panting for breath and too flustered to begin shifting forms. They must be stopped, he gasped. If the eldest dies, society crumbles. And if white dies, so too do the ice wastes. He was followed by a red dragon who shifted form into a willowy female. She quickly joined Jerny in holding Tori still. He is actually flying, she breathed. It's been centuries since he left the ground. Have you ever wondered why? Lor asked. I asked him once when I was younger. The woman, who Cam guessed was most likely Tori's mother, replied. He said he couldn't. A terrible wrong had been committed, and until it could be solved, he was staying earthbound. I pestered the eldest about it a number of times, but that's all I ever learned. But why are they fighting, Mama Gale? Tori asked piteously. They shouldn't be fighting. I don't know how to stop them, Tori, Gale replied sadly. This argument of theirs is almost as old as Toel. Cam could feel the worry and sadness in the dragons around him. He could feel the pain hidden deeply underneath fury high in the sky. Frightened sled dogs kept trying to climb into Cam's lap for comfort. The fight was clearly doing more harm than good, but neither gigantic battling dragon seemed willing to give in. Cam could feel the pull of Tori's horrified emotions more strongly than the double rage above. He pulled Tori's emotions inside of himself feeling the fear and sadness coalesce into one large mass inside. Cam drew Gale's sadness, Toel's frantic worry, and Niall's pain. He spun all the emotions together until he could feel the tight ball of it resting harshly against his chest like he was about to burst out crying. The ball burst free when Cam almost sobbed for breath, still spinning tighter and tighter in the air in front of Cam. No one else seemed to notice, but Cam could feel it drawing on all the animals around, from the frightened dogs and horses to Leon's panting as he fought to keep the wolf inside him at bay. It all whirled together. It took half a thought from Cam to focus the gigantic ball of emotion directly at the two forms angrily tangled together high in the air, and another thought to send the ball flying unerringly in their direction. On the ground, the dragons gasped closely followed by the humans, as superior eyesight indicated what was happening first. Both flying dragons had frozen in midair, their wings hanging helplessly and their tails curled in shock. They were falling rapidly, 
picking up speed the closer they came to the ground. Cam could see the heat trails left after the dragons had passed and felt their shock as the morass of emotions ate into their fury until their pain at each other became clear. The eldest's golden wings unfurled first, snapping out with a whip of displaced air. Seconds later, White's wings popped up too. The combined wind sent Cam sprawling into Lore, who was barely able to catch his own balance before Cam sent them both falling to the ground. Both dragons, the gold and the white, hovered just overhead. Cam was left in twilight dark below two dragons large enough to block out the sun almost entirely. They seemed to be staring at each other, but they were also probing the ball of emotions that was quickly dissipating into nothingness with Cam no longer powering it. They seemed to come to some sort of non-verbal agreement because suddenly they both flew a short distance away in opposite directions. They landed and shifted into human form and were walking back towards the camp when Cam and Lore finally untangled their limbs and found their feet. White flipped his long braided hair over one shoulder, keeping the strands away from an arm that was stained red from a large and deep scratch that marred it. He was panting for breath and shaking as he stopped next to Lore and Cam. The eldest came stomping over a second later. He also had long hair, but he shared the same golden shade as Toel and Nile, and it was smooth without any ornamentation. His human form appeared to be in its mid-thirties, but he stood proudly tall in such a way that made age seem irrelevant. Your kind is supposed to be extinct for a reason, the eldest snarled. It took Cam a long moment and for Lore to yank him backwards protectively before Cam realized the eldest's ire was focused on him. You're an empath, one of those animal speakers from the wilds. Your kind helped start a war that nearly threw this land into total chaos. Dragons fighting dragons, dragons destroying humans, and the wilds burning. All because of some clan of animal speakers who wish to rule rather than converse. The eldest took a threatening step forward, but Lore was in the way, joined quickly by White. You know the pain they caused, the eldest snarled at White. Our own eventual separation occurred thanks to the machinations of the animal speakers. You are projecting your pain on this child of ice, White replied calmly. This is not the eldest I knew. Have you changed so much over a few hundred thousand years? The eldest seemed to draw in on himself at White's words his outward rage and inward fear both cooling sharply. He glanced around at everyone gathered in the lee of the hill. Tori was clutching tightly to Jeremy's arm, who had his hands up protectively with some sort of spell on his fingertips. Gale was standing at Toel's side, both in human form, staring at the eldest as if they had never heard him raise his voice before, let alone start a fight. Bast and his soldiers looked torn between their gut reaction of drawing a blade in battle and recognizing to do so would be treasonous at the very least. My rage overcame my sense. The eldest apologized in a calm voice that seemed to at least relax the dragons. You and I, White said to the eldest sharply, we are raven. I never wanted to be, the eldest disagreed immediately. But circumstances dictated the necessary direction to halt the war. I took those needed steps, and humans and dragons have lived together peacefully ever since. White scoffed. You forced the humans to leave their settlements in the grassy plains. They had two options. Flee to the wilds in almost certain death, or attend to your whims in one city, ruled by one human king under your dictates. It wasn't a choice I could condone. It brought peace. No dragons have been slain or have killed in the name of some worthless cause. I saved our race and I have saved the human race as well. We have allies in the wilds now, too. Only you and your ice people refuse to comply. Now look at them. Look at you. It brought you peace, but it lost you what I thought was the most important thing in your life. White replied, his voice soft and almost betrayed. 
You caused the riving between us, eldest, when you forced peace on the lands. I caused the devastation of my people when I was willing to abandon them in return for not losing you. Cam couldn't help feeling like the conversation was quickly degenerating into a violent lover's spat. He had seen his fair share of those on the docks when a woman took a knife to her cheating husband or when a man hit his girlfriend when she refused to heed his orders. Neither scenario ended well. Usually someone was dead or in jail, or both. There would be more blood spilled if something didn't break soon. The out-of-control rage in the eldest was beginning to spiral again, and White was starting to feel futile and helpless. It wasn't Cam's place to be speaking with dragons. He certainly wasn't powerful like Lore or Journey, or a dragon with the right to speak to the eldest if they needed to. Bast seemed lost in the emotions guiding the fight. There was no one else to try to stop the situation before it got considerably worse. Cam knew the eldest had been ready to kill him just a moment before, but he stepped forward anyway. If I'm an animal speaker, then let me speak, Cam said loudly over the sounds of the two dragons arguing. The eldest? He continued as politely as possible when both dragons turned their heads towards him in surprise. Feels betrayed. He thinks you should have supported his plan and him. Cam said directly to White. He turned to the eldest next. White also feels betrayed. You knew his horde was comprised of ice witches and that removing them from the ice to join the human city would destroy his horde entirely. Yet you still asked him to give up what he couldn't. You both feel angry because you feel slighted by the other. Yet you fear what speaking those emotions will cause as well. Cam finished softly, aware that both dragons were staring at him incredulously. There has to be a compromise, Lor agreed as he stepped up to support Cam. His warm hand came to rest comfortably on Cam's shoulder as he spoke, and Cam couldn't help leaning into Lor's side. It is too late to undo the peace the eldest has created with the humans, not that we should, he added when Bast made an indignant sound. They live happily in the human city under their king without qualm. We of the tribe of the White Dragon have no wish to leave the ice either. But our presence out here doesn't cause any strife to the peace you're trying to enforce. We are not the problem. You both are. With each other. White seemed to take Lore's accusation in stride, and the eldest kept his face blank as he looked at Cam and Lore. Cam could tell White felt satisfied with the outcome of the fight. The eldest felt cautious to Cam's probing. He backed away from the gathering until he found a lot of space before shifting forms and shooting into the air. The eldest didn't fly south back to his horde. Instead, he shot straight up into the air until Cam couldn't see him. White chuckled. He really hasn't changed. He always has to be right, and he is always so calm when it comes to making decisions for others. But when he's wrong and it's about himself, he does sulk very nicely, White said with another laugh. Will he be okay? Tori sniffled, blinking his red-rimmed eyes up at White. White nodded and gave Tori a gentle smile of reassurance. He'll be fine. We managed to finally get the problem aired without any mistaken assumptions clouding the issue. I think this time we should be able to just sit and talk like rational creatures. I have been waiting for my eldest to return to me for so very long. I won't give up this chance, if you'll excuse me, he said politely. Cam watched as White, feeling quite satisfied and almost anticipatory, walked away from the gathering and shifted forms. He took off into the air, flying after the eldest with pointed determination. Well, that was interesting, May finally remarked into the silence left behind as everyone continued to stare in the direction White had flown. Was it just me, or did you feel a heck of a lot of sexual tension between those two dragons? Tom asked one of the awkwardly shifting soldiers. They were all standing together to one side of the hill, as if White and the eldest had been on stage and they the captivated audience. That's one way to put it, May agreed when the soldier just blushed. So, about those trade and peace agreements? She asked. Part 6 Tori and Journey went home. Journey had an apartment over a shop he owned and ran where they lived together. 
Bast just sighed at that admission, grumbling something about messy horde rooms moldering in castle basements before he and his troops mounted up to make the long ride south. Niall also flew back home, Leon perched comfortably on his back with Toel and Gale leading the way. Bast, Toel, and Leon all had copies of the signed trade agreement so the king, the eldest, and the alpha living somewhere very far south could all see what had been agreed to. For whenever the eldest reappears, Gale said with a giggle that showed Cam exactly where Tori got his sense of fun. I suspect the builders will begin arriving at this location within the next few days. Bast had explained to Lore and May before leaving. King Felix and I want to have this school up and running as soon as possible. The faster we can have a regulated system of witches in the city, the happier we will both be. It was with a sense of accomplishment that May, Lore, Hearn, and Tom returned to the sleds. The trade agreements would bring in essentials like vegetables and grains, which would greatly improve the quality of life on the ice. The new school was planning to set up a mentoring program, where witches had to spend a year on the ice perfecting basic skills as part of their graduation and certification requirements. Some witches might even choose to stay, perhaps adding more witch blood to the tribe. The more witches meant more protections against the elements, which meant more hunting parties could go out, which would support more children. The clans would finally begin growing again. Cam busied himself hitching the dogs back up to the sled. Each dog had to be reassured that the big dragons were gone, with a lot of petting and attention before they were calmed enough to be hooked up. The constant reminders from the dogs of the fighting, of Cam standing up and speaking to two dragons, had him shivering slightly in reaction. He felt plenty happy about the success of the trade agreements, of course, but the memory of the eldest snarling at him and Cam standing up to the eldest in return put a damper on any excitement Cam felt. Cam had just hitched the last dog onto the sled when Lore pulled Cam backwards into his arms. I felt something of what you did to stop the fight, Lore said gently into Cam's ear. I can't believe I spoke to the dragons that way, Cam gasped in reply. Cam felt Lore smile against Cam's neck. I was talking about that neat package of magic you formed and fired at those dragons, but it was also nice seeing you stand up against the dragons for being stupid, Lore explained. Oh, Cam finally said after a long moment to fight down his blush. Lore wasn't being subtle about just how nice he thought Cam's actions had been. Lore's body was pressed firmly against Cam's back, his hips tight to Cam's bottom, and it was impossible for Cam to get any other conclusion from Lore's statement given just what was poking him in the butt. You'll have to practice, Lore continued, but Cam wasn't sure if Lore meant practice his magic, which Cam had already been planning to do, or practice tumbling down in their sleeping furs. Both sounded like fun, but the latter wasn't something they should be thinking about when they were in plain view of the three people waiting impatiently for them on the sled. When we get back to our tent, I'll practice, Cam agreed. He pushed his hips seductively back into Lore's and craned his neck around until he could press a chaste yet still promising kiss to Lore's lips. Cam pulled away and joined May on the sled, hoping his fur coat hid his own visible reaction to Lore's suggestions. After a long moment, Lore climbed onto the back of the sled next to where Hearn was holding the guide whip. Moments later, they were off, gliding over the snow as fast as the dogs could carry them. It was only a short journey of a few hours, but they were racing the sun home. Originally, they had decided to sleep in the small house or barn to avoid being out on the ice after nightfall. But the fiasco with the dragons, as well as the fact that the negotiations had ended much earlier than planned, meant that if they hurried, they could sleep in their own furs that night instead. The sun was just a sliver above the mountains, heading past dangerous into deadly for those still on the ice, when the camp finally came into view. Cam immediately noticed something odd. There were many more tents than usual. Lore and May both groaned at the same time and didn't seem surprised when Kara, Ness, and Lenny all came running when the sled was spotted. May is here, Kara explained when the sled slid to a stop closest to her. I guessed, May grumbled dryly. Any particular reason why Bay decided to move his entire clan south to join ours? She asked. The White Dragon, Ness explained. Apparently, White decided to inform Bay that the clans were going to be one again. Bay's been raging about food supplies and hunting party scenes. The clans were divided for a reason. 
Laura grumbled, stepping off the sled first. We couldn't sustain a large tribe hunting the same ground, so we separated far enough that our hunting circles wouldn't overlap. It's a three-day journey from their camp to ours. White must have made them move first thing after he left us four days ago, May agreed as she joined Lore off the sled. Might as well get this over with, she added as she pulled the packing tube containing their copy of the trade agreement off the sled. Cam hurried to free the dogs from their traces so Hearn and Tom could put the sled away. The dogs happily trotted off to explore the new people Cam could see seated around the central fire, but Cam headed directly to where Laura was quickly getting into an argument with a tall man next to the fire. The man stood like Lore, as if he had power and the authority to use it. His hair was also long and intricately braided, but it was the more natural faded blonde color shared by most members of the tribe. Cam could see his eyes were snapping blue, which made Cam believe that the man must be related to Lore in some distant way. Then Lore snarled, Father, please listen, just as Cam stepped up next to him. Hey, May added, we have a solution if you just care to listen. The strange man was Bay, the leader and witch of the only other clan camp out on the wastes, and he was Lore's father. Bay snorted, Listen to my deserter son. I see no reason to lower myself that far. I am here because White ordered me to come, but I am not happy about it. Well, that's too bad, White said, clearly faked sadness in his voice. He was in human form on the far side of the fire, almost hiding behind one of the new tents as he took the time to study Bay and Laura's argument. Cam, as well as a number of other people who had been equally intent on the argument, jumped in surprise at White's sudden appearance. I never would have guessed my own tribe would be riven as well, White continued as he stepped closer to the fire. Then he blatantly turned his back on both Bay and Lore, focusing his hard golden eyes on Cam. No magic, White said quickly, throwing up a hand to hold Lore off. I have no wish to enspell our young empath or incite your ire. Cam could feel that White was being sincere, so he held still under the intense scrutiny of White's gaze. Then White blinked and Cam was finally able to take a full breath of air. When White opened his eyes again, he was focused on Lore. Explain how the arriving occurred, White said sharply to Lore. Lore nodded and took a deep, bracing breath before speaking. It was at least 2,000 years ago, probably closer to 2,000 years. There were three witches remaining in the tribe, my father, my mother, and myself. The tribe was large with many people and survived the cold and ice thanks to having three people with power. But we were too populous, and it wasn't long before finding enough food to feed everyone became almost impossible. My mother went out with a hunting party, set to travel a full day south in search of new hunting. She never returned. I told my father we had to move and that the tribe had to split in two or we wouldn't survive. He disagreed. I was sent on the next hunting party, but the drifts from the blizzard that took my mother had changed the landscape. Our navigator became lost and our sled fell into a ravine as we traveled new roads in a desperate search for game. I lost my first child, a boy of sixteen that day. Still, my father refused to move. But by then, our people were starving. My wife died after she gave one too many of her own portions to feed our hungry children. So I packed up myself and what remained of my family, gathered any followers from the camp who wished to join me, and traveled far south where there was fresh hunting. Lore finished with a final glare at Bay. You abandon your responsibilities, Bay snapped. Without a second witch to watch over the tribe, they died in droves from ice-related accidents that should have been preventable. They were dying already, Lore snapped back, from hunger, because even with two witches we couldn't feed them properly. Now look at us, Lore continued with a wave at the mass of tents circling the central fire. We have just as many, if not more, members of the tribe alive and well, simply because we split our hunting grounds. I see this is quite serious and quite unlikely to be solved simply, White said with a groan. 
It will take considerable time and meditation. Even if it takes another thousand years to reconcile, we will keep trying. However, we have other monumental news upon us as well, he said to Lore. Cam watched as May stepped forward to enroll the trade agreement so White could read it. Grains and vegetables in return for furs and blocks of ice, White read. Which is with one-year contracts on the ice from the school. He nodded to himself. It does seem mutually beneficial to me. Of course, our reliance on the human city for grains, vegetables, and fruit will end once I find the ice city, and we rekindle the hot springs underneath that melted, sufficient farmland for our needs before arriving. This is an excellent beginning to our peace agreement with the human city and their allies. Peace agreement? Bay asked, sounding horrified. Trading? What is this farce? This farce? Lore snarled. We'll save our people. More food with a varied diet will make us stronger and healthier. We'll be less reliant on the hunting in the area, which means that having more children will not destroy us like last time. Plus, having witches on lawn from the school will ensure our safety on the ice. These delusions will only bring about more death, Bay hissed despite a number of people Cam didn't know, who must be part of Bay's clan, nodding in interested agreement. No, White snapped, finally angry at Bay. Your son has learned from your mistakes. Perhaps it is time for you to learn from your own mistakes as well. Bay, you have led your clan well these years, and I will need your leadership in the coming future as I re-establish the tribe of the White Dragon. But I cannot have your enmity destroying us before we even begin. White paused to think for a long moment, while Bay simmered and Lore watched the spectacle unfold with shock on his face. It will take a few months for the witch school to be built, but once it is running, I believe a sign of goodwill from us would be to send a teacher. Bay, for a minimum of five years, you are to teach at the school where you will learn to take orders from Jerni and Tori, who are in charge. Should you learn to listen to the sound advice of others, by the end of your sentence, I shall allow your return. Bay didn't dignify that pronouncement with an answer. He spun on his heel and stomped away from the fire in a huff. Cam watched Lore, who was watching his father leave with a disturbingly blank expression on his face. Whatever Lore was feeling because of Bay, Cam could tell the emotions were old and well-worn. Lore had no difficulties letting whatever he was feeling dissipate as if he had come to terms with the problem a long time ago. White sighed and shook his head. Well, hopefully he'll come around. Lore, I leave you in charge of the tribe, he continued, emphasizing the singular noun, while I search for our city. I would appreciate it, another voice said softly from exactly the same spot White had surprised them all from earlier. If we could assuage the fears brewing in my established city before we fly off into the unknown... Cam turned to see the eldest, standing in human form behind White with his arms crossed and a small grin on his face. We can do that, eldest, White agreed with his own answering smile. White walked quickly over to where the eldest was standing and placed his hands gently on the eldest's shoulders. Shall we fly? he asked softly. Outwardly, Cam couldn't see anything other than two friends who happened to be dragons. Inwardly, however, Cam had no doubts that White and the eldest were lovers and very deeply in love. Runt, who had meandered onto Cam's feet sometime during Lore and Bay's argument, snorted in boredom. She wanted to play and wouldn't mind in the least if the dragons left. Cam glanced up from Runt's sprawled form to see White leading the way out of the camp, pulling the eldest by the hand. The eldest glanced back at Cam and nodded his head once in acknowledgement, before turning and following after his mate. Moments later, two dragons flew overhead, heading south. Cam had no doubts that he would be seeing them again. So, Laura said, letting out a loud sigh, let's get ourselves organized. 
He beckoned to a young woman from Bay's clan and to Kara and Ness. Kara, Ness, please show this young woman how our tents are laid out and help her organize her clan's sleeping quarters before we lose the last of our daylight. Kara, Ness, and the shocked young woman, who clearly wasn't used to being given a position with any responsibility, walked off purposefully. Soon after, other people started working and the crazed mass of tents suddenly grew into an organized mass. Cam stayed by the fire, playing tug-of-war with Runt and watching Lore go around and introduce himself to the northern tribe members. By the time dinner was served, everyone had a place to sleep that night and a group was organized to head towards one of the nearby ice drifts in the morning to start looking for the best way to harvest the ice for trade. Cam spent much of the evening in the kennels, helping the new dogs integrate without fights over territory or pecking order. Cam slid into his furs that night, hopeful that things would go all right. There were certainly plenty of arguments yet to occur as the two clans melded back into one, particularly between Lore and Bay, but as White had said, they were the tribe of the White Dragon. When the White Dragon spoke, somehow those wishes were answered. There was still a long way to go, a school to be built and trading routes to cement. Then at some point they would have to move into the Ice City when White uncovered it and restart their lives yet again. There was still a long way to go, Cam knew that, but none of those tasks were insurmountable. Lore slid under the furs next to Cam, his cold feet making Cam shiver and grumble even as he snuggled closer to Lore's chest. Lore would ensure things went well and Cam would do his best to be there every step of the way to help Lore accomplish those goals. Cam fell asleep, tightly held in Lore's loving arms knowing that things would all work out eventually. When you were mated into a dragon's horde, it was inevitable. We hope you have enjoyed this audiobook presentation of Melting the Ice Witch by Mel 8. This production was narrated by Albert Black. For more stimulating book titles, visit lessthan3press.com. Production copyright 2014, Less Than 3 Press, all rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.